It was the myth that they told people back in the day because it's a great selling point, right? Hey, all other sports need physical attributes, whatever, da 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 da. Not jujitsu. We use technique, right? Like it's a great selling point. It's a great thing to try to sell people on. But again, it's bullshit. The strength argument a lot of times comes from people whose technique's not adequate. And so instead of saying, hey, get your technique better. Like, you know, they say, you're using too much strength. And if anybody says that to you, if you're listening to this and someone says, stop using so much strength, be like, make me pay for it. A lot of times jujitsu can be kind of a mirror to us. It can basically, when you're out there, it'll kind of expose you to who you really are, right? Because we can put on this good face, with, like when things are easy and comfortable, but what do you do when they get stressful? We sort of put black belts up on some pedestal like there's some like whatever, you know, and um, like there's somehow better people, but they're not. They're, they're people that literally did something for a long time. And in my opinion, maybe like this is not for everybody, but I don't think for most of us that have been training for a long time that it required that much discipline to do it. Right. Because we like grappling. But he still was on the mats murdering people. Mm -hmm. And I'd be like, you can't walk fucking 10 yards without limping, but you can get on the mats and fucking rag me around. <laughs> like It yeah, just cracks me up. It's cool. Fucking glimpse into the future, isn't it, for sure? <laughs> yes, it is. We'll be there soon. Oh, <laughs> Welcome back to the Everyday Perspective podcast. Please like the video and subscribe to the channel. Today's guest is a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu legend, YouTube star, Chewy from Jiu-Jitsu. Chewy, welcome to the Everyday Perspective podcast. How are you? I'm good, brothers. I kept you guys waiting a little bit, but um, thank you for waiting for me and happy to be here. So obviously we're, we're big fans of your content. We haven't had the pleasure of training with you at any point, but we obviously had Brendan on recently who was uh, one of your students and is obviously mm -hmm. doing very well. Um, for those that aren't familiar with your content, obviously you've got quite a big following on YouTube um, mm -hmm. and provide some amazing insights, which I've been watching probably for years. And Danny, who started jujitsu about 18 months ago. Oh, nice. He usually was a bit of a guiding light yeah. in the early days. Are, I am literally your target audience, I felt. <laughs> oh, yeah, dude. You, you, you're, you're, you're one of the new guys. It's great. And, and in fairness, he's, you know, he takes some credit for this, but his, you know, his development as a white belt is, is, has been rapid. Um, and a lot of that is is definitely because of his, his approach to training, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we joked on a former podcast that he'd literally watched one of the first videos was one of yours literally talking about how not to be a Hmong as a white belt. <laughs> how not to be a what? A, a, a Hmong. It's a, it's a British word for being a bit spazzy. Okay, a mong, a mong. Okay, is it like like short for like mongol, just like a monster or something? Yeah, yeah. Okay, like a goonie. <laughs> okay, like a goonie. I, I I love the I love picking up the slang, right? Like so, um, I have a few British friends, and every now and then, if I get together with them and hang out, I always like quizzing them for their uh, for their slang because it's different than the American slang, right? So mong, I like it. Yeah, we'll probably uh, we 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 talk a lot of slang, so you'll probably get a few a few gems today from us, mate. <laughs> I'm happy. I'm happy to take some away for you. That'll be great. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, mate, I wanted to ask. I, I feel like you've mentioned this almost certainly on your on your content previously. But where did your name come from, Chewy? So that's obviously not your birth name. Yeah, so so definitely not my birth name. Uh, my birth name, my as I would say, my government name. Right when they call them asking for taxes and stuff, it's oh, Nicholas, yeah. right or Nick. Um, that's my my government name now. The name, the nickname came from me being a bit of a mung. Um, so <laughs> when I was a white belt, I was wild, man. I like I still to this day have not met a white belt that was quite as spazzy as I was. Um, I was all over the place. I had a lot of things going like kind of going there where like one, I always wanted to win. Right. I came from a wrestling background and in wrestling, you know, we weren't training year round. So back then, at least in my area, it's different now. But back then, they didn't have wrestling year round. So when we were going, as soon as we got into wrestling, it was like we're training for the, the, the tournaments. You're training to win. There is no like play around during the off season to sharpen your techniques. It's like, let's get ready to go to war, right? So I was training with that sort of intensity, that mindset. And then also, you know, something I've come to realize is that when I was younger, I experienced some different traumas, right? Where I was jumped when I was a kid. I was beat up, had my nose broken, like jumped down the street from as a kid. Um, and I was also um, basically had a, uh, was molested as a child, right? Uh, from an older guy. And so you go through those things and then you get into rolling and someone's trying to pin you down to the ground. And it's like, no, this isn't happening. And I'm wigging out. 
And so I was this like crazy, wild, spazzy guy that's trying to win, that's dealing with this deep inner turmoil of like having someone pin you down to the ground, which is grappling, right? And then, um, you know, having to deal with that. And it turned into me being a crazy guy. And so anyway, I was doing a move and I elbowed my training partner like twice in the mouth. <laughs> and Fuck. he basically, he was cutting weight for a fight. And so he's already, you know, tired, or tired and irritated. And he looks at me, he's like, you big, stupid Wookiee. And then it went from that to like Chewbacca. Basically, it was in lieu of you big dumbass that. And then it basically he would always say it as just kind of a derogatory term. Um, my one of my coaches, one of my buddies at the gym, Mike Colley, for you guys that listen, if you ever trained my gym, he's the guy that gave me that name. And then it just sort of went from that to Chewy. And then like before Facebook and things like that, nobody actually knew my name. It was just like they, everybody just called me Chewy. And they, 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 for whatever reason, they thought that like my, my parents named me that, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like there's probably some jujitsu parents out there who have now named their, their child Chewy or jujitsu, mate. So Gosh, uh, I hope not, man. I'm, I'm very <laughs> much, I'm very much one of those people with like, with, with your child's name, go on the safe side, right? Like, yeah. Don't make your don't make it weird like at the you know in that I don't know what they do in the UK for school but you know your kids first day of school and uh, you know John Luke Betty Sally whatever and then okay how do we pronounce this one you know like just make <laughs> it simple so they can they don't have to have the weird name that everybody doesn't know how to say yeah it's bonkers on on a tangent um, I saw uh, I think an article yesterday about a Swedish family who tried uh, submitting their child's name. And it was actually pronounced like Ayla or something, but it had uh -huh. 45 letters. Come on. <laughs> yeah. What are you doing? <laughs> it got it got rejected. It got rejected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Fuck but, um, yeah. Yeah, some people are bonkers with names, mate. I've seen a name before um, that was spelled like diarrhea, but the, per <laughs> but the person said that it was diarrhea. You're like, come on. You, like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, you know, like, why are you trying to like make your child's life awful? It's just a shit start for a minute. Yeah. <laughs> it's you know, just an uphill battle, isn't it? If you're called diarrhea, fucking hell. It's yeah, that's start, right. Because you know from the moment, if you give them that name, you're like from the moment when you're as a kid, you're going through things that you know they're messing with you the whole time. Yeah, I guess it saves a home band, doesn't it? I suppose just give it to them at school or not. <laughs> <laughs> And, and Chewy, I wanted to ask as well, this was something that I've always been curious about because I don't ever mm -hmm. remember seeing a story about this, but your tooth. Yeah. What happened there? So? Same story? <laughs> a little different, right? There's a different story. It wasn't really me being a, a crazy wild person. So I always tell this way. The story that like in high school, I actually had like a cap put on it, right? And so everybody thought that my tooth was normal. And in a, at one of the wrestling tournaments, I was going against this kid and he headbutted me. This is my senior year of high school. He headbutted me and the cap fell out. And so I took it, spit it out, you know, and I was like pushing the guy away. And I was like, hold on a second, ref, you know, and the ref calls timeout. I spit out the piece of like fake tooth and I look at it, I throw it to the side. I was real irritated because the guy was headbutting me. So I went back there and pinned him real quick. And everybody in, in wrestling thought that, oh, man, he got his tooth. He guy chipped his tooth and he went and pinned a guy like two seconds later. He was like, it, it was a cool story. So I never told them what really happened. So what really happened was when I was maybe, I think it was like 11 or 12, um, me and my little sister were watching. Like my, my baby sister used to come into my bedroom and we would watch movies together towards the end of the night. And we'd watch a movie and then we'd go to sleep. Um, and we, she really liked Land Before Time. That was one of her favorite movies. We were watching that, the uh, the first one. And so we watched the movie. It was over with. I had to get up for school. She's like, can we watch it again? I was like, no. I was like, we got to go to sleep, Faith. And so she's like, <laughs> kind of grumpy about it. And so I didn't think anything of it. Turn it off. And then I hear her wrestling around at the bottom of my bed doing something. I'm like, what are you doing? And then she just pops up like pew, right above my bed, throws it from the foot of my bed. And she had a uh, Super Nintendo game, those old hard cartridges. Mm -hmm. And so she threw Super Mario Brothers at my mouth <laughs> and it like hit and it just shattered my my top tooth and, you know, that whole thing. And so, you know, she felt terrible afterwards. And so I kept getting the cap put on, cap put on, cap put on. I kept getting busted out. And there's a thing that you can actually get there to, to really set it in place, but they wanted to wait till I was fully grown to do that. And I just remember that after I got the cap put on or after it broke off in wrestling, I was kind of just, eh, why do I care? You know, I'm like, I'm going to, I'm getting ready to like, I'm wrestling. I wanted to go fight MMA and stuff. So I'm like, I, this is probably just going to keep happening. So I'll just get it put back on once I'm done fighting and stuff. And, um, you know, then it just became a thing where I just don't really care because 
I don't know. It, 20 years later, deal. you're still fighting. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just like at this point, yeah, it was still fighting, but also too, it's like, I mean, I wear a mouthpiece now, but even then it's just, I don't know. It's It's interesting, this thing where, like it's just a chip of a tooth, but to some people it really bothers them. And I find it hilarious. I'm like, why does this bother? Because it happens all the time in the videos. People are just like, what's going on? Get your teeth fixed. I'm like, why do you care? <laughs> I've never had, I've never had a cavity, right? Like, so my teeth are relatively straight. I have never had a cavity, but this one chip freaks you out. It's this weird thing where we always want to like try to cover up all of our blemishes. And I'm like, I don't really care. I'll wear it out probably. Cause I think people's bodies tell a story, right? So like, yeah. okay, like this one was funny, but like your, our ears get mangled. We have, I have scars on my face from uh, cuts from elbows and knees and stuff like that over the years. I, I kind of like them. I think uh, it gives you character and it makes you a little different than trying to be the perfect mold that society says that this is the way that you're supposed to look. Yeah, I agree, mate. And yeah, and, and me asking wasn't for any dislike. It was purely because it's quite a distinctive feature for you. I think we mentioned to a couple of people who weren't familiar with your content that we were talking to you and they were like, oh, I have I seen, seen him? Uh, maybe. And we said, you got the beard, big guy. Oh, and we were like, chip tooth? And like, yeah, chip I know the guy. <laughs> <laughs> it's a calling card. Um, That's I've it. Got a I've got a picture over here of one of the guys that he drew a picture of me um, and he drew like the big chip tooth on it. It's so funny. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so it's like right there. It's like, exactly. So it's like, um, it, it's like sometimes we, we like to cover up the blemishes and the things that make us different. But in some cases, those are the things that make us stick out the most, right? Um, so you could try to make yourself fit in and be like everybody else, but you can also do little things to make yourself a little different. And, um, granted, I wouldn't advise you to go like knock your teeth out or anything like that, but <laughs> Hey, if it happens, go with it, whatever, who cares? Uh, build the grill. Remember him, Bill, Bill Cooper. That was his whole thing. He had like the, the grill, right? So, um, yeah, <laughs> anyway, love it. No, it's good, mate. Um, Chewie, I wanted to ask about your your journey with obviously jujitsu and well grappling and competing because I, I know mm -hmm. you've obviously wrestled and you did some MMA as well. Um, I wasn't aware of of obviously the the trauma you experienced as a child until you just mentioned it. Mm -hmm. um, was that was that like a catalyst for you getting involved with contact sports at all, or was that just um, yeah, was that unrelated? You know, I, I didn't think about this until I was an adult. Like there was never a conscious decision. Like I experienced trauma. So therefore I wanted to, um, go learn how to fight. And by the way, I don't want to be like, I, I'm not going to wear the badge of I'm a trauma survivor or anything like that. It went through it. It was an experience. Um, but I think it was what led me to want to get into fighting because, you know, like for instance, when I was seven in seventh grade, I was a kid i was like 12 years old and there was a 16 year old i grew up in a rough neighborhood there was a 16 year old and then there was like an 18 year old whatever i'm walking down the street and like i just get cracked and they broke my nose um and then like the dude hit me with a bat on the side of my arm and like no reason not not premeditated it was just like i was the i was the mark i was a, just a young kid walking down the street and you know, you go through that experience and I went from being this young, vibrant, active kid to all of a sudden becoming very reclusive. I didn't want to go outside. I was scared to go outside and uh, wrestling and fighting seemed like one of these things where this is a way for me to learn how to like just be confident. And, and again, I, I didn't, I wasn't searching for it like unconsciously it be or uh, consciously. It was more of an unconscious thing. It was like, I wanted to be comfortable. I wanted to be strong. I wanted to be able to stand up to myself. So I got into weightlifting. Um, and then I got into uh, wrestling and it was those things in particular, those two things, uh, compared to all the other things that I did when I was younger, that really all of a sudden I felt like I could, like, and I could, I, I remember, I could go to school and stand up for myself. So if a bully got in my face, I would just blast double leg him, toss him on the <laughs> ground. And I mean, that's it. Like they don't know how to defend it. And it was like, all of a sudden, like, oh, I'm, I'm safe. And then all of a sudden I could walk down the street. I'm not so scared anymore. Um, and then my muscles are there. I, I'm not fat anymore. Cause I got fat when I was reclusive. And all of a sudden I'm, I'm like, I've got little crevices in my arms and stuff like that. And, you know, girls are talking to me. So it was those things where I think I was led towards those things in the, the, the experiences that I had when I was younger really pushed me into them. And when I ha started having success with the ability to be physically strong and confident, to have like power um, over someone so that they couldn't have power over me, it led me to even want to do it ever even more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I can understand that. Danny and I both grew up in fairly deprived areas in the UK and uh, we didn't have wrestling, but we, we boxed quite yeah. a lot as kids. So um 
so yeah, similar stories. So I was physically assaulted a couple of times from some horrible bodies in the tough neighbourhood that I, I grew got up in. So much, mate. Yeah, like uh, people say, it. I got fucking battered at times. Yeah. You know what I mean? Growing up. Let me ask you. So with that too, like one of the things that really like collected me into wrestling, really pulled me in, was the brotherhood of it. Right, where we're beating each other up. And you come to know people in a different way when you go through those kind of experiences together, when you're literally beating the crap out of each other. You have a certain connection to them that you can't quite explain. That's very different from normal, like conversation, like the guy you work with, like, eh, whatever, you know, him, it's cool. We might be buddies, have a drink, whatever. But like me and this guy beating the, the tar out of each other for like three years, like we feel a different connection um, to each other. I, I felt that in wrestling and I really loved it because I all of a sudden had this, like I had male mentorship, I had brotherhood. I had those things that I felt like I yearned for and a lot of young men do. Did you guys have that same thing in wrestling or not wrestling, but boxing? Did you have that same kind of camaraderie or brotherhood? I wouldn't say so. Not for yeah. me personally. It's nothing compa compares to jujitsu. And no, I, okay. I, I don't know if it's. Yeah, I, I, I think boxing gym seems to be a lot more competitive, gotcha. um, and there is a lot more bravado and and yeah, competitiveness. And I think because you're just punching, mm. and you're not, you know, you're not having cuddles. Um, yeah, I don't know. It, it, it wasn't the same. Certainly, okay. it, it was because I because I found jujitsu. I started boxing when I was thirteen, um, and continued like. So it was about 17, 18 into adulthood. And then I think I then came back to like Muay Thai for a bit when I was 19 and eventually found Jiu Jitsu when I was about 22. Okay. Um, and the experience I had, yeah, sort of around the brotherhood stuff from, uh, from uh, Jiu Jitsu and the grappling sport was very mm. different to striking sports I found. Maybe it's the team atmosphere because like in wrestling, you're on a team, but it's still an individual sport, but there's still this thing like we're a, co a cohesive team. And so like we would go together, we did everything together. Um, but at the same time, we knew that we were, we were an individual when we were out there, but we were still a team together making this happen. So maybe it's just like that there's not a um, necessarily like, hey, we're a team versus like we're out, each one of us is competing on our own. I don't know. I think I think people in general, though, kids, they should all do some form of sport. Like he, I, I played foot, I played football, and I, I had that. I, you know, what I mean, all my friends who all played football with me, soccer. I was gonna say, which which football are we talking about here, <laughs> yeah. Danny? Yeah, the real kind, the real kind. <laughs> hey, you, you guys came up with soccer. We just took the term. We were like, hey, great term for football. Yeah, you're gonna right? take we're gonna our great soccer. game and call it a call it a shit name. That's what you're gonna do. <laughs> we we play the, the style of football where you use your foot against the ball. <laughs> yeah, we we play the style of football where you occasionally use your foot. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, when you have that like that um I don't know that team ethic. You all get your friends from that. You all you all play football together. I, mm. I often find people that don't play sport they end up just a bit more lonely. Mm -hmm. You know, you see the. I, I remember friends from school and that. And if they didn't let to play any sports, you just miss out on a lot. Even if you're not very good, it doesn't really matter. I think everyone should just take part in the physical benefits of it as well. Like you said, like when you got some muscles, even if you're playing football, or whatever, you lose weight. You do get stronger. You get a little bit more popular because you're around more people that are all in shape. Mm -hmm. You're a bit more confident. Like you said, with girls, everything, isn't it? You, you know, sat, sat in your room doing fuck all is never good for you. Yeah. And I mean, there's so many, like it's, you know, sports and, and things like that and athletics, they can be these things where you get a chance to play around with certain virtues and character traits that you can then use when you get out, right? Like for instance, when you're having to really grind towards something and maybe sometimes you don't feel like you get a great payoff from it, but you keep going and then eventually you do. It's like, okay, that's that's a that's a reminder that the payoffs a lot of times for things that are worthwhile aren't going to be immediate. Um, but also even the way that we deal with social dynamics, right? Like you know, maybe you worked your way up and you're one of the the upperclassmen you've been around, you know, the ins and outs. And then, you know, I remember this, like, you know, football seasons, it's, uh, you know, American handball, football, whatever you want to call it, right? Uh, the one where we occasionally <laughs> we kick it. The um, I, I remember, you know, we'd be suiting up for pads. In my senior year, I remember like seeing one of the young freshmen, you could kind of see he's a little nervous. Because we're, we're, the first day we're getting ready to like put pads on and crack at each other. And, you know, this is before like we really knew about all the CTE stuff. So we're getting, we're going hard. Right. And I could see him a little nervous. And I remember being that nervous. I was like, I used to be there. So I remember I came up and I, I put up my hand on his shoulder. Hey, bro, it's going to be fine. I was like, look around at everybody here. I was like, we've all been doing this for years. We're still here. Everything's all right. You'll be good. Don't like, don't let it, don't let it sweat you. Right. Just kind of letting them know, like I was there 
And, you know, you can take that when you get out later on. So when you're in those situations and you see those people in your groups that are, they're going through it, you know, you can be like, hey, I went through that too. Come on, man, let me help you out. You know, and I think there's all kinds of beautiful things that you get a chance to practice with. Um, you know, both from the internal, even the way that we, we present ourselves externally in sport, like you're saying, Danny, and it's so valuable when you get out into the regular world because you have experience with all these things. Yeah, I agree. And I'm just thinking about the boxing thing. Yeah. I, I, maybe it's that. Cause I think with boxing, it's, it, it feels like it's quite attribute based, you know, versus something like jujitsu. Um, I know you, you obviously you get your specimens like brand as an example, but you know, for the most part. I think it's a technical pursuit, isn't it? It's a skill acquisition and, and people... It's a mix. Yeah, sure. Um, but I think with boxing, I think, you know, you have you can come in as a, as a strong guy and have that puncher's chance straight off the bat, mm. whereas yeah. you don't always have that in jiu-jitsu. And maybe as a result, you get some of the more successful guys in the gym has, haven't been all the way through that journey, perhaps. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, there's something to that. I mean, jiu-jitsu obviously attributes play a good role in it, right? Because, I mean, you can take a guy who's athletic and, I mean, it's just – when you when you come up against different humans, like I said, that are genetically different and um, they remind you that like there's different people out there. They're not like normal people. Right. Um, but at the same time, there is a technical thing to it, because, I mean, you look at even the people that make up the the lion's share of jujitsu. It's these a lot of times I don't want to say nerdy. But like maybe a little so like very like they're they're like got they're like kind of eccentric people that sometimes have these little um, nerdy little like you know hobbies and things like that they're very thoughtful people and because jujitsu is very like it's a very wide swath of stuff that you can do right we don't have a lot of constraints um, I was just talking to a, a judo a judo guy that was here in town black belt in judo and he was saying that for him. He thinks of like judo is checkers and jujitsu is chess. He's like, in judo, we only have so many things we can do. We can't leg lock. We can't um, go for attacks for shots on the legs. We, you know, there's only things we can do, but we get really good at these, like boxing, mm -hmm. for instance, right? We, yeah. we have these two weapons. But he's like, with jujitsu, it's like, you guys can just do all this stuff. It's all over the place, right? And so, you know, there is a level of, technical ability where you can put people into weird positions that they're not prepared for and you can technically out finesse them and you can negate a lot of their attributes um you know but again at the end of the day you know you take two people um equally technical equally skilled whatever but one is like genetically gifted and in great shape or does a lot of strength conditioning that person with the superior attributes and good technique they'll win you know i mean it just is what it is yeah all day and, and i think I'm just uh, just into my 40s now. Danny's a little bit younger, but in his 30s. And I'm finding that now where I'm trying to maintain a level of technique to to kind of offset my aging body as I, mm -hmm. as I continue to compete against these younger and younger guys coming in. Um, and a lot of that is definitely down to attributes. So you're absolutely right. I completely yeah. agree. I'm doing the same thing right now. I'm retooling my game because a lot of like my – it still it still works, but – like, for instance, when I go against Brandon, I can't out scramble and outwork Brandon. You know, like Brandon was one of those guys where he started making me. It was a blessing and a curse, right? Like it was a curse because all of a sudden a lot of the stuff that I used to use where I'd like change directions and go back and forth and basically like work people down and be able to beat them. It didn't work on Brandon because like he's a superior athlete to me. So it made me have to reconsider some of my strategies. And so now it's like I'm retooling my game where I'm going through and like figuring out all these really tight positions where I can slow things down and cook people and basically outwork them with superior positioning where they're always at the disadvantage. And I'm making them use lots of energy to engage with me. And over time, I chip away at them. And um Eventually, I'll share more of it once I get it all fleshed out. But that's kind of where I'm at because I'm almost I'm I'm 38 right now. I'll be 39 in March. And so the writing's on the wall. And so I'm changing my game up now. And so um, I'm going through that path now. So I'll be probably sharing more about that in the future because I feel like there's a lot of us that are getting to that point. I think I, I, <clears throat> I watched a video. I th the first time I seen Brandon was on one of your videos when I think you just said, yeah, he just mauled me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah, I was the hammer, now I'm the nail. I think you yeah. used. <laughs> well, there was there was one man. It was real bad. I came back from Costa Rica and I didn't realize it, but I had um 
I had some sort of infection or something going on. And I, you know, I just thought I was like a little tired from travel. And so usually when I'm just tired from travel, I'll just train and I'll, I'll like, you know, be fine. But Brandon, you know, and, and Brandon thought that too, but Brandon was like, he goes, I'm coming after you today, old man. And golly, <laughs> he, I mean, he whooped my butt. Granted, he's, he's, he's given me all kinds of problems um, when I was hundred percent healthy. But I remember it was like a couple days later, I was sick as a dog. And, uh, I was like, whatever, you know, it was great. Um, but even the first role that I ever had with Brandon, you can go watch it on the channel where it was when he was in the middle of wrestling season. He came and trained, didn't know much. He knew like a little bit of jujitsu. And I mean, just like, whoa, like throwing me or like, I, you know, I'm, I'm able to sweep him and off balance him, but like, I can't put him into stuff. And we only did pass and defend rounds. So like, you know, if I swept him or whatever, then I would and got on top, we would uh, reset. And if he, you know, uh, passed my guard or whatever, we would reset because I didn't want to risk him getting caught in the submission during wrestling season. But it's like that just the level of explosiveness and his scrambling a bit. I mean, it was just crazy uh, to deal with. But uh, you, there was that video. And then again, just throwing me all over the place. And people will watch that video and they'll say, how, how come you didn't do this, that, or whatever? I'm like, bro, it's not that easy. It looks easy on the camera. And I think sometimes the camera will mistakenly make things look a little slower than what they are. But then when you're actually experiencing it, it, you know, I mean, you feel like you're in a washing machine. It's like happening really <laughs> yeah. fast, you know? You do, don't you? Yeah, you do. <laughs> so thinking back to your, uh, your own transition, because obviously you had a, 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 maybe sort of tell us what, what, what your biggest accolade in wrestling was in a second mate but i'm not sure but obviously you came from a wrestling background as did brandon and then transitioned into jiu-jitsu at some point and you kind of explained mm -hmm. that you were a, a bit of a monk when you did that and yep, yep. I'm, I'm curious to, to i guess to, to understand what insights you you kind of now have from that that you've shared with brandon so looking back on your own transition from wrestling to jiu-jitsu um i guess like what would you have done different so brandon didn't have some of the same problems that I had, right? Because again, a lot of times jujitsu can be kind of a mirror to us. It can basically, when you're out there, it'll kind of expose you to who you really are, right? Because we can put on this good face, with, like when things are easy and comfortable, but what do you do when they get stressful? What do you do when a little bit of anxiety kicks up or whatever? Like, do you have the courage to fight through that anxiety? Do you have the ability to control your frustration or, you know, whatever? Again, it gives us a mirror into who we are. And again, mm -hmm. it gives us a chance to work on some of those things, I believe. That's my thought, right? Um, it exactly could be, it right. could be, it could be just working out. It could just be training, or whatever. But that's the way that I view it. I feel you find, find who people really are. Yeah, there you go, right? You find out who you are. 100%. Um, so with Brandon, the thing about Brandon is, and I believe most men do this, most men, especially when they're young, they have this drive to prove themselves both to themselves and to the tribe essentially around them, right? And it's at that point that they've proven something that they can kind of ease up a little bit because their ego has a good enough grip that they're like, you're worth something, right? But before that, you're always still having that negative loop like, you know, I haven't done anything. Who am I? Right. Mm. And especially if you look in, you know, you look at every society from, you know, uh, you look at all the old, like ancient tribal societies when they were like very raw and primitive, when the women would go through like their own cycles when they're younger, right. There would be a celebration. Ah, you're now this woman. You have a, you have a gift to, to give life, right. You have a special power, right. Men, it would be like, Hey, now you got to go do something because mm. men have to, they, we had to do something to become a man in the tribe. And so, you know, you look like I think of it as Superman, like there are superheroes. Women would be like Superman. You have this gift. You have this special power. Men were like Batman. We have to develop some sort of skill to like be worthy of something, um, you know, and you could even look in like um, look in like, say, our culture. Right. So like if you found a, a woman that did nothing, but like she was very attractive and guys just flowered her gifts, we're like, eh, whatever it happens. But if it's one of your buddies, one of your mates and he's like not doing anything and he's just like you'd be like lazy bastard get off your ass do something you know mm. again it is what it is i say that because brandon had already accomplished a lot with his wrestling yeah and so yeah, when he yeah. got into jujitsu he had nothing to prove he wanted to win and he wanted to do well but he wasn't coming in there rolling to like beat everybody because he knew practice doesn't count right like i he's like i've won three national championships if i lose a round in practice this shit doesn't matter mm. And so he understood it. So he didn't have the same because I was still trying to prove myself to myself right when I was younger. Um, but then there were still some of the problems where like, hey, 
you need to work on this a little bit more. So let's work on your guard a little bit more. We need to develop that. Um, and that's what I could give Brandon some, some insights was basically like, you know, he would be in a position and I would be able to give him a critique, a little adjustment. But as far as him falling into the normal traps of wrestlers, he didn't because normal wrestlers come into jujitsu and they have this identity of I'm a wrestler. Brandon didn't have that identity. He was like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm grappling now. And so he started mm. studying jiu-jitsu, watching matches. He wasn't dead set on I always have to do the takedown. Like a lot of his, a lot of his training when he's not getting ready for a competition, he's playing guard. Like he's playing leg locks. He's expo he's expanding his game, right? And then when it comes time to get ready for the competition, he's like, okay, let's go back to our A game. But he's always developing new weapons. And so I think a lot of people, if they saw Brandon roll in a competition, but then rolled with him would be surprised at what they feel because Brandon might let him pass his guard so he can get escape rounds. He might try to put him in a leg lock or some sweep opposed to actually trying to take him down because he's playing a game and trying to get his weapons. And I think, again, a lot of that comes from the security of knowing deep down that like, hey, I've already done stuff. So now you can kind of play. And I think that for a lot of people, we talk about sometimes that practice doesn't count that like you need to like let go and relax and play. And it, it is the truth. You need to do it. But I think for a lot of young people, and I think this is more, it's not just men anymore. This is women too, um, because they're, they're, they're subjected to a lot of the same pressures that we are too. You have to like prove yourself to yourself on some level that you're worthy, right? And again, we have this just drive to do these things when we're in competition and everything else. And it's like once we've done something in our life at some place, we can back off and have fun with things. We can actually enjoy it and just play a little bit more. And that's when I think you really get good. And you see this a lot of times from older people that get into jujitsu who, who have accomplished something in their life outside of the gym. When they come in to train, they're like, you know, they're 35. They've already, they do this. They're already like, they have their kids or whatever. They have their, their business. They come into training and training doesn't represent the same thing that it does say for the 20 year old who doesn't know who they are yet. You know? So I, I think it just, the age and some of the experiences you've had changes, but to go back to it, I get, I'm, I'm going on long tangents here. I think that you find those things out, though, through the through the training. And like Danny and you guys were saying, like you find out who you are through the training and when you're exposed to the stress and the uncomfortable spots. Yeah, no, it was a great tangent, mate. That was very well put. And um, yeah, I completely agree. I think, um, yeah, it was really good insight. Um, tell us about your own journey before you got to Black Belt in Jiu Jitsu. Um, like what part of it? Because it was it was a, yeah, it was a long, long journey, huh? Did I, did I did I watch a video? Did I watch a video that you got demoted about? Or was that wrong? Oh, I didn't. I, I gave I gave up my belt willingly. So here's what happened. I can't, I can't remember. But yeah, I, I did demote myself though. So basically, right. what happened was I was training at a gym with my original coach from 2003 um, till about 2007, um, and. I went to the new gym and for, a, for some different reasons. And when I started training there at the gym, um, they ended up having this uh, Brazilian coach there for maybe three or four months. And this Brazilian coach, he was a little different. And, and I, I would find out a lot, of, a lot of stuff behind the scenes that was going on that wasn't so good. Like, he wasn't the best guy. But, you know, whatever. So during the training, he was there. And um, I remember there was one day where we were doing judo throws, right? Now, I was a wrestler. I'd never done judo. Um, you know, the stance of standing up straight wasn't very comfortable to me. I, I've never done an Osoto, you know, all these different things. And so we're doing these, these throws, and I started to notice that for different reasons, and this is looking back at it, I think he did not like me because I think I was um, – I think maybe he was intimidated by me a little bit because a lot of guys would come to me and ask questions and me like, again, going back to it, I've always liked to be that way. If I see some guy going through it, I just like helping. So I'm like, Hey, yeah, I had the same problem. Let me help you out, bro. And so I just, that's the way I always was. I like helping people. It's fun. And then I think he saw that. And sometimes I could see him looking and get, would get frustrated. He would never roll with me. I remember if I rolled with him, like he would like stop in the middle of the roll. And there was one time where we were going and I passed his guard real fast. And I was like, I passed his guard. And I'm like excited, whatever, but we're going and I'm a purple belt. So I want to test myself against the black belt. And he stops. He goes, chewy, chewy, chewy. He's like, you two, because he couldn't speak good English. He's like, you two, er, be more. And he got up and walked off the mat. Like, I was like, whoa, I'm like, come back. Show me, like, do it to me. Like, yeah. let me, let me feel it. Right. I want to feel it. 
So he was literally a let me tell you something, let me tell you something meme without telling you something. <laughs> That's right, right. Like, no, no, <laughs> let me you, tell you something. <laughs> you're doing it wrong, right? And then you get up and walk up, like, come back, come back, like, let's roll. But he wouldn't roll with me. But anyway, there was one time we we're doing judo throws and he's like practicing the throw. And then he's like, he's using me as the UK and he's showing the step in for the Osoto. And so I have no. Like usually when you're going to launch someone and throw them, you like say, hey, okay, I'm going to throw you now. Like get ready to break fall, right? So I'm just kind of, mm. I'm watching his feet and everything else. And he like, boom, throws me hard. And I land, I'm like, Ooh, and I'm like, take my breath out. I'm like, holy shit. You know, like, I know, I know how to break fall. So mm. I'm like, oh, and he's like, oh, chewy, chewy, chewy. He starts laughing at me. And so at the end of class, um, my other coach was there who ended up being like one of my main coaches, Kyle. He interpreted and basically at the end of it was saying that, you know, there's some guys here that you know in brazil would not be a purple belt because they don't know judo throws where obviously he's talking about me i was literally the only purple belt on the mat so i said screw it so i came up and i'm like i'm showing submission i'm like okay listen man here is my belt you give it back to me when you think it's right and um you know that sort of thing now later on kyle actually told me that what he said in portuguese was, was like some of you guys suck um and you're like basically he was being very derogatory uh so he kind of churched it up a little bit so anyway i give him the belt back i let it go and then i remember he, he eventually left because there was a, he was he was crazy or whatever and then um when the other guys that I actually knew colin and kyle they're just like here put your belt back on dummy like <laughs> You know, put your belt back on. You're tough, you know. And so then I learned from them, and I gained a lot of insights from those guys because they they helped make make my jujitsu so much better. It's a wild story, though, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, well, th this is like sometimes people will say, like, I'll do a video where I'm talking about someone says they're dealing with a crazy coach, and sometimes people are like, Oh, that didn't happen. I'm like, Bro, you don't know, man. Sometimes there's people that get into these positions as coaches, and just because they're a black belt doesn't mean they're a great person. Sometimes they're nuts. And so, like, I'm like, I've, I've seen it, you know, like, so I've experienced it. So you never know. And then when you got your black belt, were you uh, were you at an academy where they did speeches or whips? Um, speeches like you mean, like say something. Yeah. So what did you have? Did you have like a black belt speech? Yeah. So black belt speech, and then I I got a, we do gauntlets. So I got a, I got a okay. whip too. You did both. Okay, a black belt. You still got whipped. Oh yeah, yeah. I okay. I did the, I, I I got I went ahead and walked my gauntlet for my first three stripes too. Yeah, yeah. Oh my black belt. I don't know if I'm gonna walk it anymore, but like I was like, <laughs> no, I'll, I'll walk the gauntlet. I mean, I'm like, it's whatever. It's really not that bad. I'd rather take a, I'd take a gauntlet over a Shark Tank any day. Um, you know, gauntlet's just like it stings a little bit. It's not that bad, you know. But I I feel I still think that there's something about having there's still something about having like at the end of some sort of ritual, something to like cement it. Right. Like, you know, and, and cause we do this stuff, like even like my buddies that were Marines, they'd have like, they pin them with the, uh, they'd have their like little medals or whatever their, their mm -hmm. insignias and they would slam it into their chest and it would stick them. And again, it, it, there's something to that. And again, I know sometimes in modern society, we're like, Ooh, that seems unsightly or whatever, but I think there's something to that when you have a ritual of some sort to commemorate something and you have this moment of like, boom, like to cement it like this. You're going to remember this, whether that be a shark tank, whether that be a gauntlet or whatever it is. I, I think there's something to it. I know not everybody likes it, but I think also, too, you have to have a good coach to contain it because I've seen some gauntlets where they're just like <laughs> they're really whipping them really hard opposed to like. Hey, everybody gets their one whack on your back and then it's done, you know, and yeah, um, yeah. usually at ours, everybody's <laughs> laughing and it's, it's, it's a kind of a fun thing, you know, so, but I, I, I walked the gauntlet. Yeah. Okay, cool. And, and with your, uh, your speech, what sort of stuff did you talk about? I mean, what did it mean to you getting your black belt? So my black belt was interesting. So I, my mother was sick with cancer, um, at the time and she had been for months and my the day that I got my black I remember having a dream about this and it's weird but I remember having a dream about this happening and then it happened my, the day that I got my black belt my mother passed away it was like the same day um so like I I remember I was there we're at a seminar and you know I would basically at that time I was going to the hospital and I would like sleep on a cot like in the hospital room with my mom I'd get up I'd go train come back I mean basically I was living at the hospital and um and then I left and my mom was on like, um, like basically end of life care. So we knew she was going, but I remember I left that morning, went to the seminar and, uh, my coach who was the head of the affiliation was there and we're doing the seminar. And then we just stop. 
we just stop in the middle of the seminar. It was like, we just stopped for some reason. I'm like, what's going on? And then like, you know, like the guy comes up, he, he ties the belt around me and says, you know, congratulations, Chewy. And he hugs me really hard. And he says, I'm sorry, brother. And I'm like, what do you, what do you, what do you mean? Sorry. And I look over at my other buddy and my, my, my good friend at the time, Derek, he just looks at me, shakes his head. He just looks and he, um, he, uh, he basically was like, you know, you, she just passed away. Um, oh, you know, so, yeah. So, um, and so like, it just happened instantly. I remember I, like I crumpled, um, and, uh, that was that. So like when I, so then I was done for the day. Like I, there was no promotion or no, there was no ceremony afterwards. I, uh, that was it. And so then later on that day, um, I, you know, I went back to my mom, Derek, my business partner at the time, or, you know, he was running the gym. He wouldn't let me come back to the gym for a week. He said, just go somewhere, do something else. And, um, I uh, came back uh, about a week later and we had a, an official belt whipping and speech ceremony. And um, when we did that, that was a, that's when I got my whippings and stuff. And so really it was just telling pre- people I appreciate the support um, because as much as I might be like externally like, hey, guys, I'm Chewy, like in front of a gym or in front of a, an audience or whatever for jujitsu stuff, I, I have no problem being the center of attention. Mm. But I'm not very good at accepting anything beyond that. So like during the the whole time, a lot of the guys didn't know that my mom was sick. I didn't talk about it. Like I would go to the gym and that was my escape from it. Um, yeah. And I would come back to her. But like I'm not going to I'm not going to bother you with what's going on with me because, again, that's not what you're here for. And so when it happened, there was a lot of guys that reached out to me for support. And so really my speech was like, thank you guys for just being there to support me. And so that's what that was a lot about. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And and I wanted to ask as well, man. I don't know if you've ever really thought about this, but it sounds like you've done a grappling. You've done grappling for a very long time. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, been a black belt for many years. Uh, wrestling before that. Have you ever thought about who you would be or what you'd be doing if you weren't doing this? Hmm. I've tried to think about the person that I would be if it wasn't for grappling. I don't know because it's so weird. It's like I got started in grappling when I was. I started grappling when I was what fourteen. Um, so I've been grappling for 24 years. I became an adult on the mats. Like I got the male mentorship that I needed as a young man on the mats. I, all the virtues and things like that, that I think we, we can learn in a myriad of other places I got from the, the training, right? Like I learned how to deal with adversity and I learned how to control my temper and my emotions. Um, and, and you understand that being emotional is not going to be a good thing really anywhere. Um, and, you know, learning to develop courage and to belief in self and self-reliance. I learned all these things through jiu-jitsu and, and through wrestling. Um, and so I don't know who I would be without those things. It's so hard to understand because I, for, for me, like, I don't know. It's like weird. Like when I started grappling, instantly like something clicked i like this and by grappling i mean wrestling from the moment i wrestled it was like the happiest thing in the world like i remember in in, during high school when wrestling season was going my grades were great i had perfect attendance i was great when wrestling season wasn't in i was almost depressed Mm -hmm. and then when i got into jiu-jitsu after high school like this is it like perfect and so at that point my life revolved around jiu-jitsu rather than anything else and so i it's so hard for me to fathom being like not having it there i just don't know who i would be i don't know who my friends would be i suspect i wouldn't i suspect it wouldn't be the best place um because i didn't find like i really did i i just i couldn't imagine myself being in the best place coming from the situation that i did um if it wasn't for doing what i do and what i've done yeah no that's fair mate and and i asked because i you know again i found jujitsu fairly young and I've, I've fluttered it in and out over the years. I'm, I'm still near purple, purple belt, but I've kind of, I started about 17 years ago and, and certainly in my early 20s or sort of growing up where I did, I left school with, with no sort of grades or qualifications or anything and, and not many prospects and not a lot of purpose. And there was definitely a period, you know, in my early 20s where I just was absolutely clueless and directionless. Mm. Um, and, you know, we, we didn't have a huge jujitsu scene where I was, you know, living at the time. Um, but it was, it was just something. And, you know, some of the attributes and some of the things that you get from jujitsu, like the, the resilience and just overcoming adversity and also just having a place to go and switch your mind off. Mm-hmm. Um, just, just got me through, you know, a, a, a definitely a testing period of my life. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I think it does that for so many people, doesn't it? I, I've seen, it, it completely transformed so many people um, who have 
you know, it, it's all relative, but to, to each individual, their problem is everything, isn't it? And jujitsu seems to give them a, one of our friends, one of our training partners, um, he's a karate guy, um, brown belt in jujitsu as well, but he talks about mushin, which is sort of... Yeah, no mind. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Um, and I think that's one of the wonderful things about jujitsu. Um, and one of the next questions I wanted to ask is if people ask you what jujitsu is, what you say to them, because, you know, you could say it's Mexican ground karate, but mm. <laughs> it's so much more, isn't it? Like we've just talked about, like, how do you explain it? Do you go into those, those nuances and the brotherhood and everything? Or do you just talk about the technical components? No, you just like, the thing is, is I think you kind of do some, some people, and again, we talk about these things, um, but you can't get into the nuances until you've really gotten into it. Right. Um, so what I tell people, and, and this is generally what I think about jujitsu, it typically starts off where the technical information, learning how to fight, learning how to defend yourself, learning how to tie another grown man into a pretzel and be able to submit them, man or woman into a pretzel, and submit them. That's what attracts people. That's the perfume, right? That brings them in closer. What gets people to stick is like you said the, the the evolution of the learning the essentially the meditative quality of it the community and brotherhood and uh, sisterhood that exists in the mat like all those factors are what keep people um and so little, literally when people ask what it is if they don't know i'll just say uh, you ever watch ufc uh-huh mm -hmm. <laughs> take out the punch take out the punch and the kicks there you go yeah, and it's yeah. like my little like my real quick answer so they understand what it is because that's what people become attracted to initially um, and then later on, you they decide, you know, man, this has changed my life. And I think sometimes we hear people, I've seen this happen many times where people will come into it and they'll have listened to, you know, Joe Rogan, Jocko, myself, maybe you guys, Is anybody talking about these profound benefits that they've had um, through it, right? But it's like, hold on a second, like, because you got to go through some stuff to get there. It's not fun going through it. It's difficult, right? You're going to have to get your face smashed by 300 pound big Bubba who's got his <laughs> chest hair sitting in your mouth and you pull it out like floss later, right? Like it's not always going to be pretty, right? But it's like, you know, I've, I've had people come in and they're like, they're waiting for this profound experience. It's like, well, hold on. So that's going to come some down, somewhere down the road. Let's just worry about like, doing an arm bar right now you know because it's through those things it's like i'm reading um the anabasis by xenophon right and so he's talking about the march of the ten thousand greeks out of persia getting them back and it's this crazy journey of of these guys and all the crazy stuff and he has all these little philosophical ideas along the way that he's experiencing but you're like okay he only got those ideas because he went through all this struggle he's watching people die he's having um all these hardships he's going walking through snow with no shoes on and he comes through these ideas through the hardship, right? It's that warrior philosophy, right? It's it's not a heady, let me just think about this. It's like a, it's a philosophy that you experience through your mind and body and spirit through the difficult struggles you go through. And so going to your your, your question, and I don't explain any of that really in the beginning. They, they can watch my videos and get that. What I'm more de focused on is like, let's teach you how to do some escapes, man. So you stop getting Bubba's uh, big uh, chest hair in your mouth, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> I, I wish I found jujitsu so much earlier. It's my biggest what got regret. You into it, it's like I only found uh, my friend actually. So I I played football for years and years and years to a fairly fairly okay level, and then I got loads of injuries. So like broke my arm and dislocated my shoulder, broke my wrist. So by the time I was like twenty nine, I was pretty broken. So I was mm. just every time I was playing football, I was coming on for probably I don't know two or three months and getting a bad injury. Then I was off for the rest of the season. It, that was happening for a few years, and then I started. You know, I was a personal trainer. So then I was like, oh, it's all right, I'll go gym. You know, I'll just, that'll be my new hobby is the gym. But it's fucking boring. Like I, I use the gym to keep fit and I do enjoy the gym, but as mm -hmm. my sole hobby, I, I it just doesn't motivate me enough. Yeah. Then I tried CrossFit and then CrossFit's good, but then I was like just breaking my body. You I know, was going to say probably CrossFit a different load of injuries. So, yeah, it's just so demanding on your body. You literally break your body to a point of just like, yeah, you just fucked. Um, and then my friend started jujitsu. And then the the reason he got me into it was be just literally because he said, like, you'll love it because you can carry on learning. Because he knows what I'm like. I always try and, like, learn more things and try and expand everything. And then, yeah, as soon as I went, went one session and I was, like, fucking, I was hooked. You know? Was, I was straight away. Like, one session, I was like, I fucking love this. And then what am I like now? I'm, like, fucking obsessed, and I? <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm always wanting to learn. I always want to know more. Always fucking probably doing Paul's fucking head in, to be honest with you. But it's it. 
I, I just wish I found it in my mid twenties because, in all honesty, I didn't even know what jujitsu was. Even yeah. when like my friends started doing it, I kind of knew. But again, like you said, it's like it's it's UFC with no punching. You know, that's yeah. what I thought. I thought, ah, it's, you know, it's a bit of ground fuckery. You know. But yeah. you say this though, mate, and we've talked about this before, and I'd be interested in your thoughts on this, Chewie, as well. But maybe it's a UK thing. I don't know. But he's come in at such an amazing time now. Because when I started, we were literally learning out of Habiru's book, book and we would, you know, we'd occasionally get a Brazilian over for a seminar that would teach us 20 techniques and we'd maybe mm -hmm. absorb one. Um, but it was a lot of just, you know, in the basement on dirty mats, just trying to figure out stuff. And occasionally, I don't know, someone might go to the US and come back with a new technique and we'd work on that for the next six months. But mm -hmm. it was tough. There wasn't a lot of resource, whereas as much as Danny says, he wishes he found it earlier, maybe, you know, a few years. But I think such a good time now because there's so much resource you've got people like you just share all this amazing information you've got endless bjj fanatic instructionals now um and you've of course got uh, an array of of guys and girls that have been doing it for 10 15 20 years that are all on the yeah. mats with you yeah i think of it you can think of sometimes you can think of training almost like a there's like a medicinal pr uh, property to it right like it can be like a medicine and like sometimes you're not ready for it Right. So like if you hadn't gone through all those different problems with football, like and broken your arm and shattered your wrist and all these different things, you know, you might still be thinking, man, maybe I should keep going back. If you like, like let's say if you came to jujitsu, like, OK, I like jujitsu, but maybe I wasn't done playing football. Maybe I still had something there. And then you're like, you're, you're you're basically I'm done with this. Right. I'm done with this. I am closing that door behind me which then makes you available for you to open the door to something else. And I always think about that because it's like, you know, you watch athletes in different sports where they kind of like they hang on, hang on, hang on until literally this isn't happening anymore, right? You can see fighters where they don't stop fighting when they should because they kind of keep questioning. Maybe there's a little bit more in me until there's like literally nothing left. So mm. maybe uh, maybe you wouldn't be ready for it. But it is a really interesting time with jujitsu. It's very big right now. It's grown a lot. Uh, the resources are more widely available. The gyms typically have a a much more they have a de they have deeper ranks. You know, it's it's not just like white belts with a with a purple belt or teaching or whatever. It's like you've got a lot of uh, people filling in the ranks, and so you can get better faster. And um, there's a lot more competition uh, options. There's a lot more uh, information for learning, and there's even more options for doing something with it. Right, so it's a uh, it's a cool it's a cool time for it for sure it's very different than when i started in 2003 100 percent yeah it's a it's a good time to join in mate honestly yeah, no i'm glad I, I think as well my enthusiasm i maybe wouldn't have the same enthusiasm if i'd flitted in and out of it at a younger age do you know what i mean mm -hmm. if i was if i'd started 10 years ago and i kind of done what you done where i've done a year here come out of it and then when i started now i might have been like ah you know it's just jujitsu whereas i feel yeah. like i'm like a kid with a new fucking toy yeah <laughs> Well, it's like when I met my wife, I remember like telling her, like, I wish I would have, because I knew her for years. I mean, I wish we would have dated when I was younger. But then I was thinking about the person I was, I was like, maybe we wouldn't have been good. Maybe it's good that I <laughs> that we started dating when you were, because I probably would have ruined the relationship if I would have been younger. Like, like I met you at the perfect time um, because I was basically ready to find a woman and settle down. And so it, was like, it worked out great. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's yeah, absolutely right. And, and just thinking about the 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 growth of jujitsu at the moment and the the influx of of people finding jujitsu, um, and and obviously the you know the I guess the scaling of it as well. So we're seeing more and more gyms. Uh, we're seeing more and more black belts opening more and more gyms. Um, so naturally, like with anything, you're going to see a watering down in some areas of the art, um, and that's going to lead to to obviously good and bad gyms. What's your thoughts on, you know, what, what's, uh, you know, what's the key watch out for someone trying to find the gym? What would be a red flag for, for a gym to maybe avoid? Well, I mean, I guess maybe we should think about that. So what do we mean by watering down? Because I hear, I hear this term, but I'm like, we should be careful because, you know, sure. Like when I first started, like, like when I first started, if you, tr if you were training, it was like, it, it was game on, bro. Like you walk in my very first day, I got knee barred. Right. Like I, I didn't really know what a knee bar was, but I was like, well, shit, I'm caught in something. I guess I'm going to tap. Right. Uh -huh. um, it was a fight from day one. And if you didn't stick, so what? Like either get tough or quit. There was no there was no beginner classes. I look at some of the guys that I have in my gym now that are coaches 
And they are the product of having beginner classes to get them ramped up. Like one of my guys, he's probably one of the toughest guys in my gym, a guy named Ben. And Ben came into the gym and he was nervous about coming in because he was an overweight, chunky, like fat teenager, right? Comes into the gym and he came in and he had a lot of tutelage from uh, some of the one of the guys, Derek, who was helping teach some of the beginners and helping like work with them. And now he's like he's a tough SOB who teaches the MMA uh, training and he has he's a pro fighter. I mean, I fought in the same sh shows as him and we used to train MMA together back when I was still fighting. I don't think that guy would have been possible if we just said, all right, kill or be killed. You know, maybe he would have. I don't know. Um, but I, I think that just you know, sometimes we can kind of romanticize about, oh man, everything was so tough and hard. Jiu-Jitsu is such a bunch of wimps now, whatever. I'm like, there are plenty of really amazing, tough individuals in Jiu-Jitsu that are just, you know, tough as can be. Does Their toughness is no question. But also at the same time, if you're trying to make this available and accessible for people who are not necessarily like, doing this full time who can't train five days a week, whatever, who, you know, have kids and wives and they're maybe not 20 years old, then you're going to have to like, uh, like undulate the training a little bit. It can't just be come in and kill each other every single day. You have to help them out a little bit because, you know, you get a 35 year old who comes in to start training. If he takes an injury, he doesn't recover like a guy's 20, right? His, his body's not going to be as more resilient. And so again, th I think there are bad gyms, but I think sometimes in jujitsu now, like we, we use that idea of watering down um, a little bit gratuitously because we're like, you know, okay, if you're not training like Daisy fresh, you're watering it down. It's like, you're not, not everybody's supposed to train like that. Right. Because you you don't want to be the world. You want to learn how to do this. You want to be able to share this with your family. You like the brother. You like all these things. But, you know, you don't want to have your neck wrenched across and need surgery next week. Right. Mm -hmm. Or whatever. I'm not saying that they do. I'm just saying if you train really hard, you're going to your body's going to go through the ringer and you're going to need some help. Right. You don't want to have to go through that. So I think, again, I, I, I'm not saying that you're doing this, but I think uh, just for people listening, because that watering down idea, I think, is a lot. And I think that some of the watering down was a good thing. Because it's accessible. And a lot of us that are old black belts, we can't train like we used to train. So if I went into a gym that was like my old gym when I first started, I wouldn't have been able to do this. You know, if I was like almost my age now, I'd never trained before. I wouldn't be able to make it. Um, yeah. So there's that. But again, so side tangent. But as far as the bad gyms, again, it's going to be different for everybody. There's things about gyms. First off, you got to consider there is no one type of jiu-jitsu gym. There are gyms that sort of uh, will run the sort of spectrum of incredibly traditional martial arts to very relaxed. It feels like a wrestling room. I tend to prefer the relaxed wrestling room environment. I love that environment where we're all in there. We bullshit a little bit and then we train hard. Um, there are some formalities, some like respect and things like that, but otherwise it's very loose. Like for instance, I've seen gyms that have lots of students and they actually have, they're very good, but they're to me, they're weird. Like for instance, I've gone to gyms where like, the white belt can't go ask the black belt something or they can't come up and say, hey, would you like to roll to the black belt? It's like against the rules. I went to a gym one time and I'm hanging out and this white belt. He's like looking at me. You know, he's kind of like <laughs> at the side of my eye. And I'm like, like, I, I keep seeing him look at me, you know, and I'm like, hey, bro, what's up? And he like comes and walks over. And I'm like, what's up, man? He goes, uh, just talking to me. And he's just kind of like sitting around. Like, would you like to roll? He's like, I'd love to roll. I'm like, why didn't you ask? He said, well, we're not allowed to at this gym. I'm like, oh, bro, that's some bullshit. I was like, if you want to roll, come roll. If, if I'm here, I, I'm open, right? Now, if I don't want to roll with you, I can always decline. Um, you know, and but but again, I'm a, I'm a human being. I'm, I'm there. I've, I'm on the same road as you. I'm just a little bit further along. So those things I find weird. I think that's why you've been so successful, because you treat people like a real person. Even on your videos, you're very personable. And you say that sort of thing a lot. And I think... The thing with the warring down, I always find it's from like a lot of old school black belts and they often moan about new gyms and they'll mm. say like, yeah, it's being watered down. Oh, ah. they, you know, they've opened up down the road and it's a shit gym because they, they give so-and-so a blue belt after six months or eight months yeah. or a year or whatever bullshit it is. And I always find with that sort of like, I don't know, that sort of comments is it, it feels like they're scared to let their, their jujitsu go. Like, you know, mm. they don't want everyone getting the secret. So that's how I feel coming into it, that it's like, you know, it's precious. And I understand that, but. 
No, that's a good point because you'll get a lot of people that will say, like, for instance, if you're not having some sort of attachment to all the old self-defense stuff, that somehow you're watering the art down. And again, I from the moment I started jujitsu, I looked at some of the old self-defense stuff that we we never did it, but I looked at it and I was like, that's bullshit. All this bullshit. I mean, like, like these grips, like, hey, buddy, I'm going to grab you, and then you're going to rip around. It's like, that's not how fights look. I grew up in neighborhoods where people fought. We scrapped. Um, you know, you now we have we have these, right? We have phones. So every fight gets recorded, right? Every fight. As soon as people see, they're like, they're pulling their phones out. And fights look very simple and repetitive. They look almost like, again, sure, there are guns and there are knives, and that changes everything. But in most Western countries where you're not trying to kill everyone, right, in most cases you'll have fights where he scraps with their hands a little bit. And they look like regular – they look like MMA fights, you know, like but just way uglier, right? Like guys swing a little bit. They clench up. Guy takes them down. And then if, like, the guy has any training – it's, I mean, it's done. Like if it's a boxer, he clubs him, knocks him out. If it's a judoka, he throws him. If it's a wrestler, he dumps him. If it's the judo guy, same thing, or jujitsu guy, the same thing. And it looks very repetitive. And I'm not saying that there's not an aspect of fighting jujitsu, like where if you throw the punches in and understand how does how does this like you know this guard pass that I'm doing, how does this work with punches? Or you know when I'm in, in if I'm in half guard, how do I use this? Or if I'm in a full guard, how can I use this in control distance to not get hit in the head? All of that stuff's fine. Ad adapting what you're already kind of doing, but then you see all this old self defense stuff where it's like we don't ever use this in live situations, right? And you can't because it's so scenario specific. But that's like, get out of here, you know, but I, I do think, though, I do think it is important, like if you are doing jujitsu and you're like, hey, I want to do some I want to I want to do this for self-defense. I think one, you should invest at least a little time in boxing or kickboxing to understand how to strike. And I think every now and then, it doesn't have to be all the time. It can just be an understanding of it. Put some put some gloves on and let people try to hit you a little bit. Let them hit you and understand how to control grips um, to control the distance and understand how that works. And obviously, a coach can teach certain uh, aspects of that. I think that stuff can be very useful. Uh, understand, I just call it fighting jiu-jitsu because it's like almost the same. It's it's like the basic white belt stuff that you do, tight guard passing, uh, full guard, half guard, a few other things, a little bit of butterfly, um, and you know, mountain back. But understanding those positions, but then just basically adapting it to a fight position. Um, you know, but I think you're right, dude. A lot of times I have heard people say watering down. It's a lot of times because of the the martial fight aspect. Um, a lot of, is what they'll say. But again, the reality is, is that a lot of times fighting someone that's untrained is generally fairly easy if you've ever had to do it. And so, again, it would be very boring to train like that all the time. So the game becomes jujitsu versus jujitsu, and that's where we geek out and we play and we have a lot of fun with it. And um, again, I think even in that aspect, going to a jujitsu competition gives you something that like no training in the gym can give you, which is you get used to dealing with a situation where you don't know this person. They're coming at you 100 percent and you have to operate in a highly stressful, anxiety ridden uh, situation where, you know, if you go, if you're on a street, and some guy attacks you, it's not going to feel like it's in the gym. It's going to feel like you're in a situation where you don't know the person. They're going 100 percent and you're going to be filled with all these uh, different feelings that you're not used to. And so I think that for me, like having fought in a had a situation, I fought in the street and also having fought in MMA and Jiu Jitsu and train, being able to compete in MMA or Jiu -Jitsu, Jiu Jitsu, having that same kind of feeling that better prepared me to be very comfortable with the feelings that I felt when I had to protect myself. Yeah, no, I agree. And then, um, yeah, but then the, the weirdness with speaking to black belts, any of our oh, yeah. red flags you see? I mean, again, it, I think it, it comes down to this. It comes down to what do you what do you want out of a gym, right? Um, so some people really like that formality. They they love like bowing to the pictures. They love all that stuff. I I don't like it. I, I think it's very weird to me. Um, you know, I, I gotta wear we I gotta wear only, I only get to wear the team gear. I only get to wear the team rash guard. I don't get to wear anything. I don't like any of that stuff. Um, and so that, that like for me that would be a red flag. It's not my thing. Now some people don't mind it, and that's okay. Um, I think the big thing is like you know you, you would just want to be. I mean use your common sense right if you've got a coach that's spending way too much time with like young girls or something obviously there's a problem right um if you've got someone that's like a coach that's hitting you up for money or they're constantly coming into the gym boozing and drunk right like there's a problem you know again normal human behaviors that you should raise a red flag to i think the problem is sometimes we we sort of put black belts up on some pedestal 
like there's some like whatever, you know, and um, like there's somehow better people, but they're not. They're, they're people that literally did something for a long time. And in my opinion, maybe like this is not for everybody, but I don't think for most of us that have been training for a long time that it required that much discipline to do it. Right. Because we like grappling, bro. The only the only prerequisite to get a black belt is just you keep training for a really long time. That's it. And you get better in, by and large by doing that. I don't need discipline to go to the gym. It's like the dessert of my day training. Like even to this day, like doing all the the business work and doing things like that, that stuff takes time and and energy. Going to train with the guys, going to an open mat, thank you. I love doing that. Always have. So it it didn't take much discipline to get a black belt. I enjoyed doing it. Um, And so again, you know, I, I don't think it requires as much discipline to do it. I think, you know, discipline is like a lot of times, like, what are you eating when you go home and what's your lifestyle? Like, how do you treat your family? You know, those things that aren't maybe always as fun as easy as just playing a game with the guys. Um, but you know, treat, treat black belts like human beings and regular people. So if they're doing things that you think are out of step with just regular human behavior, then it's like, that's a problem. You know, and so I think if you go by that, really, it's very simple. But I think sometimes they people give passes to like black belts because you're like, well, that's my coach and he's screwing up right now. Ah, he's my coach or whatever. Like, no, he's just a dude. Um, you know, and again, if they're doing <laughs> something and if there's something that's going on, you should be willing to approach them. Um, and if you don't feel like you can come talk to your coach, granted, sometimes we can be intimidated by people in like hierarchical settings. Right. Because even sometimes my students will be when they're new, they'll be afraid to approach me. Um, and I even have to tell them every now and like, Hey guys, you can come talk to me. I, I kind of wear this resting, like pissed off face. Cause I've got like a really heavy brow. Um, and so I'm like, I'm just, this is how I look. I look pissed off all the time, but you know, I have to tell them it's, I'm, it's good. But I think sometimes you can be intimidated, but if you've ever like brought something out and your, your coach is like, like went crazy on you for something, then there's a problem, right? Um, if you wouldn't accept that from someone else and there's, unless there's some reason as to why they're doing this or they're trying, you know, they're deep down, they're trying to make you better. That's a different situation. Um, but I think maybe that's kind of your, your, a good litmus test, right? Is, you know, are they acting like you would expect regular people to act? And if they're not, then, you know, you have to assess, are they really trying to help me or are they just kind of maybe being, you know, in a situation or in a way that I don't, I, I wouldn't like to be around. Right. And if they're not, then don't be afraid to, uh, to mix things up a little bit, possibly change gyms or be willing to confront them and talk to them about it. Yeah, that's good advice. And I think uh, I think the same could be said about about you know any any kind of profession or interaction you have with anybody, right? They're just just people. Um, and then just thinking about, I guess you know the audience. So we're going to have you know sort of jujitsu practitioners watching this, and we will definitely direct them to your content as much as possible. But thinking about, I guess maybe a sort of technical and behavioral perspective new white belt or white belt, should we say, what would you typically think they should be focusing on? I mean, I I think that this is my thought, right? Um, When you come in, like we we say it and we say it all the time, you got to learn how to survive. Because when you come into the gym, you are going to be bombarded with all these new techniques and you're not really going to, you're not going to know how to defend them. And so you're going to spend a lot of time getting submitted. Um, and you're learning how to pull your elbows back and not let your arms get exposed. And you're learning how to, you know, build frames in the bottom and learn how to, to you know, use your body and shrimp out. So you got to learn how to survive in all those positions like guard, bottom of mount, bottom of side control, that whole thing. That's kind of the start of it. And then typically with, you know, with a white belt, if they're brand new, if they have no wrestling experience or whatever, then it's like, okay, now we need to learn how to, after we can survive, then how do we regain guard? How do we use guard? And then after you can use a guard, whether a half guard or full guard or butterfly, because I consider those your really basic guards that you can use pretty early on, then it becomes, okay, now once we get on top or we have a submission, but if we have a top, now we're sweeping, now how do we work from the top position, right? And that's kind of a a natural sequence, I think, for a lot of um, white belts when they come in without any experience. And again, surviving literally means looking up at the clock I lasted a little bit longer today than I did yesterday, right? Like learning how to pull your arms in. So like I tell like a, like a lot of my white belts, um, when we do beginner classes, we'll do a drill where, okay, um, the bottom, the top person is going to try to submit you bottom person. All I want you to do is just ball your arms up really tight. You're not going to escape. You're not going to try to regain guard. I just want you to see how long you can last because what happens is when people get really focused on just one section of their body, like their arms and they don't let their arms get exposed. Well, your arm typically not for if your chokes are involved it changes but if we're talking about arm locks most arm locks sort of a prerequisite is the arm begins to be pulled away from the body in some way i don't know of any arm locks really that start from here 
right? Mm-hmm. Like I, maybe they're, I mean, maybe a wrist lock or some weird thing, but like your arm bars and things like that, they don't, uh, Kimuras, key locks, they don't happen when the arms are here. So if we get really good about bringing the arms in tight to the body, then it's like, oh, that's where I start with if I get in this position and we work from there. And if you understand that you have time because you know how to survive, it makes the escapes easier. And then once you can escape and get back to a position, then you know you can go for a sweep or a submission more effectively because, hey, if they get me in side control, I know how to survive and escape. Um, you know, and then if you're on the top and you're passing guard, if someone sweeps you or whatever, you're like, it doesn't matter because I can escape and I can get back on top. So that kind of sort of cycle, I think, is, uh, is helpful in the beginning. Yeah. So what have you been doing? <laughs> no comment <laughs> Danny how big are you uh, 94 kilos 94 kilos so you're a pretty big guy how tall 5'11 5'11 okay ah, look at you using some of those imperial units there we go <laughs> um, uh, so the 5'11 uh, so yeah so you're a pretty stocky guy then yeah 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 so you look like it so yeah you're probably playing top position right no no you're playing guard po, po guard Start, start nice. every time. He's got a good uh, half guards locked down to electric chair game at the moment. There you go. Yeah, half guards. You, you, if you don't have super long legs, half guards the way to go. Yeah. Do, do you know this is an interesting question as well? Actually, mate. We we I've, ju- I've just thought of it now because so Danny's a, a big guy and he's actually got a lot smaller. So you were what like one ten? One eighteen when I started. One eighteen. So and you, were, and you were playing soccer. Oh, oh no! So I, when, I, when I was, I was like, football, Jesus, bro! Like, when I was playing football, I was like, I was like, uh, I don't know, maybe like ninety kilos. Okay, and then okay. I was always stocky. I was more like a rugby player. And yeah. Then okay. When I when I stopped playing football, I put on weight after the injuries and whatever, and then I started I getting you. into powerlifting and gym and then yeah. just yeah just put on weight you know okay that makes sense because i was wondering I was like bro if you're you're like that big i was like i don't know how the hell you're playing soccer because that's a that's a hell of a lot of running for a body that size yeah just look like a big rugby player mate that's it just this is true but at least at least at rugby you get like those those like scrums and you can like get into the shoving match and everything else <laughs> but you know all technique mate yeah so when danny first started jiu-jitsu he was a, he was a lump he was an absolute lump and he, he's he's been on a you know as as with many but he's he's lost a lot of weight through his journey mm-hmm. but when he first came in um he naturally ran into you know the, the typical sort of attitudes around not using strength not using mm-hmm. attributes and i think that for a period kind of put him in a in a maybe it was a good thing it's helped me now i think but yeah, yeah. but i think he was worried to, to to kind of play top because he was worried about using his weight and his strength Mm-hmm. And therefore, he's developed quite a good bottom game. And he's, you know, he's pretty good on top as well. Um, so don't let him fool you. But the, the question from that really is, what are your thoughts on attributes? Because I, I'm a bigger guy as well. I'm a similar weight. I'm, a, I'm about 6'1", so about 186. Okay. Um, and yeah, about 95 kilos, so about 210, I think, mm-hmm. somewhere around there. Um, so I'm a bigger guy. And as a result, typically, I'm not that quick. I'm not that agile. Mm-hmm. quite strong, not that flexible either. So my attribute primarily is strength, but I'll come against mm-hmm. a smaller training partner. They're not as big, they're not as strong, but their attribute is maybe speed and flexibility. Mm-hmm. But I sometimes get a little bit of attitude because I use a bit of strength, mm-hmm. despite the fact they're using their attributes. What are your thoughts on that? So jujitsu practitioners were fed a lie, a myth if you want to consider about strength. You know, they'll say, oh, you're not supposed to use strength, right? It's this naughty word in jujitsu, right? The thing is, is like to pick up this phone right now, this requires strength, right? Like if you're an infant, you don't have the dexterity and the strength to hold certain things. You just don't have it. So I can hold this phone and do this because I have all this strength in my arm. So we're going to use strength to do everything. And when you think about jujitsu, even in general, you've ever, you ever heard someone say they got some grappler strength, right? They don't look very big, but they've got a grappler strength or they, you might see someone that looks kind of skinny, but man, he's strong. What is that? He's developed muscles and he's developed strength in those muscles, contractile force for necessary movements for what we do. Maybe not big bulky muscles for like pumping iron, but he knows how to use his muscles specifically for what we're doing. So there's an inherent thing where when you're doing jujitsu, you're developing strength whether you want to or not. Like I could take my body from when I was a young guy when I first started and I did not have the same type of strength in very specific muscle groups that I do now from doing jiu-jitsu for 24 years, right? So it's all bullshit. You're going to use strength. There's no way around it. The key is learning how to use it efficiently, right? So when it comes down to start rolling, 
we're all going to fall back on our attributes at some point, right? So whenever you start to get into a situation where you don't have the technical skills necessary to combat the opponent, you start relying on, you're reacting at that point. And whenever you react, you're now relying on physical attributes. You don't have a choice. So for instance, if you know someone cuts an angle on you, you are going to have to turn and rapidly try to put yourself back into position. And what's going to happen? You're going to have to push a little bit more instead of having this beautiful frame set up. You're going to have to use your flexibility to put your leg back in whatever it's going to happen so again it's nonsense um again it was just the it was the myth that they told people back in the day because it's a great selling point right hey all other sports need physical attributes whatever da 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 da, da. not jujitsu we use technique <laughs> right like it's a great selling point it's a great thing to try to sell people on but again it's bullshit um so again we all use physical physical attributes so my thing is it's not about telling people not to use it it's like let me show you how like, so when you, if you got a big, strong guy who can bench press a house, okay, listen, don't push up with your hands. And if you are, we're going to push at the hips. If you're on the bottom of the mount, we're not going to push up on the chest. We're going to push on the hips and we'll use our frame and we can, we can incorporate these big, strong pushes, these big explosive hip drives, but we use them in the right times. And so I think it's more about showing people how to use those things. Cause you're right. Right. If you've got a guy who's very flexible. He might have someone showing him how to use his flexibility in a rubber guard, pulling his leg in front or something. And that's considered to be okay. But I can't do a rubber guard. Like, not like that. I can't just pull into a go-go plot. I don't have the flexibility for it. Right. So that means that, like, again, he's going to have options on the table that I don't. Likewise, sh- with the strength person, with the person that has a lot of strength, if they have developed the attributes of strength, which are to me, it's actually kind of ridiculous because strength's available to everybody. Go pump some iron. Some things like certain attributes that people have are not easily available. It's pretty easy to build up some strength. Just get on a damn bench press, get on a squat rack, do some weights and eat some food. Um, It's not a big deal, right? But again, you know, anyway, slight tangent. But anyway, going back to it, you then you're going to use these attributes. So we each have like plus and minuses against who we are in our games. And so to me, it's fine. So I think that, again, you use all the strength you want to as long as it's in, it's in conjunction with your technique. And again, really what you have to do is you then have to be mindful of who you're using your strength on. Like if I'm mm. if I'm rolling with, a you know, a guy who's like, um, you know, 110 pounds, right? Like or like I've got one of my one of my females that trains with me, Julia. Julia is like 105 pounds. She's very, very small and thin. I'm not going to come at her and use 100 percent of my strength. Right. But then if I go with my guy who's like, you know, he's about 220, so about 100 kilos. Well, or I'm using my strength on him because I got to, you know. So, again, I, I think it's fine. It just um, – I, I think that sometimes – I re- honestly, to, go, to, to finish this up and I'll s- shut up for a second, is the um, – the strength argument a lot of times comes from people whose technique's not adequate. And so instead of saying, Hey, get your technique better. Like, you know, they say you're using too much strength. And if anybody says that to you, if you're listening to this and someone says, stop using so much strength, be like, make me pay for it. Like if, if I'm doing something that's technically wrong, show me, make, make me pay for it. And I'll listen to you. But until then it's like, I'm going to keep doing it. And to me, in my (laughs) eyes, like I should, Right. So if like if one of my students is doing something technically wrong with strength, I'm going to try to make him I'm going to make him pay for it. So if I arm bar him, I can be like, hey, see, you pushed up on my chest. This is how I arm barred you. Stop doing that. But until I do that, me doing that, that's basically me just saying that, like, I'm frustrated because I'm losing and I know I shouldn't be losing, but my technique's not good enough to adjust to it. Yeah, no, that's that's great, mate. And that was uh, what uh, what I was hoping you would say. But I remember a while back, I think we were training with doing um, doing skate work and you know, you were doing all the right things technically, but you just wasn't shifting me because he wasn't using any of his strength. And then yeah. we had a word, he now uses strength and he's a fucker to hold down now. So <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I was just being too nice, like in general when I was rolling, because I was, again, just, just a bit paranoid of like fucking hurting someone or just doing something, I don't know, stupid. Because yeah. at the time I had a few higher belts when I was rolling and, you know, I picked up jujitsu up quite quickly, I'd say. And as I was getting the better of some people, they would then go straight to, are you using too much effort or you're doing this or you're doing that? And then I was like, fuck's sake. And I was going to Paul and I was like, are they saying this and that? And he was basically telling me, like, it doesn't fucking matter. They're just, they're yeah, just, yeah. Uh, just not liking That's it because you get the better of them. And then, uh, yeah, and then we were doing those mountain escapes and it was like a light bulb moment, wasn't it? It was like, he was like, you're just not putting enough fucking effort in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then since that point, I'm like, fucking, yeah, if I'm in those positions, I'll, I'll, I'll be explosive to get out of them because it's the only way I'm going to get a big fucker like him off me. 
Well, and, and if you are getting like, let's say if you're using all that effort and you're not getting any return for it, mm-hmm. like because you're because your hands are out of position and the guy just plants you in the bottom of mount or side control, you're going to quickly say, man, I need to figure something else out. And then you become more receptive to it. Right. Because, again, it, it's information if we don't have a reason to understand it has no significance to us it's like math as a kid right you're like what does algebra mean to me i don't know this doesn't doesn't it seem stupid um you know in jujitsu like one of the things that i'll do sometimes with my students is let's say that we're going to um work if i if i want to teach them back escapes i'll spend a week doing like back submissions so that everybody's getting choked out so that this way, next week, when we go over back escapes, you're going to have a reason to remember. It's kind of like <laughs> it's like plowing the field, tilling the soil so that we plant that seed. I've got to break up that that the the I got to break up that hard ground before I can do that. I got to break up your mental attachment to things before I can actually give you that information. Yeah, that's wicked. And then just um, going back to, to, I guess, the the focuses for the belt. So we talked about white belt and you offer some really good insight there. And then sort of moving up to blue belt. So that's obviously a, a huge jump for people. Mm-hmm. I've got a friend who trains at a different academy. I feel I feel so bad. He won't mind me mentioning this, but he <laughs> um <laughs> he he's a big strong guy actually as well. But apparently he 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 kind of handles it well. But he recently got his blue belt and uh, he kind of was expecting it, got his blue belt. Mm-hmm. And I I kept teasing him about the blue belt blues. And I said, mate, just just when you get your blue belt, these these things are gonna happen, right? So you're gonna have achieved this goal and then you've got this this void um you know of 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 where that goal was that you need to kind of to to, to manage but then also what's going to happen is all the what good white belts are going to come after you all the you know the blue belts are going to come after you the the higher belts are going to stop giving you concessions Mm -hmm. the poor guy's first session as a blue belt he got his bicep fully ruptured by a purple belt who mm. armored him so it was uh. so bad so i feel i jinxed him i feel awful he's he's yeah he's had surgery he's currently going for recovery he's still doing jujitsu but he's just kind of doing some privates and just very carefully working around some technical was stuff was it tore like off the bone yeah, yeah. like, yeah, like yeah. oh he'll be he'll be good it'll it'll heal up and he'll be strong afterwards so yeah should be a problem. so uh so yeah he got the surgery pretty quick so it was within good. like eight days so his recovery is good but yeah, I just it's a it's a just a, just the irony of the story after the conversation we had, and and I wanted to ask you about the blue belt blues. Do you think that's a real thing? It can be for some people. I think what you said kind of was nail on the head, right? Because goals are weird, right? When you have a goal that you think is meaningful or that's worth something, there's almost a sadness associated with once you achieve it, because now it's like, well, what? Now? As humans, first off, we're never going to be happy with where we're at, right? We're we're on this like treadmill of like any time we achieve something, we move to a new level, we become it becomes normal at some point, and then it's like, what else, right? So you can go chase the big house, the fancy cars, the this, the that, whatever. Doesn't matter what you get, you're always going to want more, right? Um, mm-hmm. And so you got to be careful about your goals, and you got to be careful about ascribing so much to them because again, it's not what you get that really matters is who are who are you turning yourself into along the way by doing this stuff what are the character yeah. what do you actually have right mm-hmm. and when you think about that it reminds me of in the book the alchemist the uh, there's a there's a part of the book where he's going to egypt and the guy is talking about how he would love to see the pyramids it's his dream to see the pyramids and he's like well come with me come see the pyramids he's like no, no i can't do that because then the dream would be gone and i'd have nothing to live for Right. You're like, oh, so, you know, again, it's like there's that sadness when you get a goal. Now, obviously, a blue belt, it's a couple of years of training. Maybe it's not that big of a deal, but sometimes people put a lot on it where they come into training and they see the blue belts, they see the purple belts and they see these people. And it's like they're so good. And then you move incrementally up to that point and then you get there and you're like, whoa, I don't feel any different. I imagine it's the same thing for parents, right? You have a, you have a kid and you're like, oh. I still sort of feel like I'm the same person I've been since I was eight, right? But like, obviously you're not, but you, you, you were expecting maybe some profound thing to like the, the the sky would open up here. I'm now an adult. No, no, you're just, you're a, just a human being and you're still figuring shit out, right? Just, um, just very tired. Yeah, exactly. Very tired. tired. You're not, you're not sleeping <laughs> much, right? I'm still a child, mate. That's right. Um, so, you know, again, I think that's kind of the um, the thing. So I think Blue Belt Blues can be a thing, um, but I don't think it really has to be if you don't really put so much attachment to the belt. I never had Blue Belt Blues. I came from wrestling. Belts were not a big deal. I never cared about the Blue Belt because it was like, I for whatever reason, I was like, I'm probably never going to get the Blue Belt anyway. That's So I thought the Blue Belt was such a big deal. So I just sort of said, I'm probably not going to be good enough anyway. So I just started training. And then I got the Blue Belt, you know, around a year or whatever. And it was like, oh, cool, you know. 
there it is. Let's let's keep training. You know, um, I I never really cared about the belts because I was just focused on training and learning how to beat people with techniques and competing and everything else. No, yeah, that's fair. Yeah, I think there's a lot of variables there, isn't there, to, to consider when it comes to that. I guess it's a hard one to know. Um, with the with the belts, you said you got yours after about a year. Obviously, you had some grappling before that. Yep. And I think I had one of your videos previously where you talked about um, allowing belts to kind of bask in the sun, I think you said. At the end season of their, a little bit, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, there's there's a pro, there's obviously a, a sort of a difference of views there on occasion where some people feel there needs to be kind of a time served in order to get a belt regardless of, of skill. What are your thoughts on that now, kind of having, I guess, made that jump from, from white to blue relatively quickly, but now being a coach and, and having many students? Jiu-jitsu belts are a little weird because, again, every gym is a little different. We all do it. That said, there's generally a reasonable kind of – there's a reasonable, like, level of, like, coherence to, like, we kind of – like, you go to a gym and a lot of times you kind of fall – if the gyms are decent, like, you know, a blue belt's a blue belt. I mean, it is – you, 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 it's not too far from it. And like most gyms will go and like every now and then you'll go to like some gym where maybe if you're at like a more of a hobbyist gym and you go to really a heavy competition gym, mm. there may be a big difference. But assuming you're going to like your average jiu-jitsu gym, it's pretty, it's pretty close to a standard. Um, even if they're not a, necessarily trying to do that. Um, for the belts, I still kind of lean on what I said where – Again, a lot of times I like to give people a little bit of time at the belts to, to basically, like you said, we fight to get to the top of the rung of this belt. And then before I send you on to be at the bottom again, let me let you enjoy this for a minute, right? You fought hard for the year, two years, whatever. Enjoy the sunlight that you're at because as soon as I put you to the next belt, you're going to be at the bottom of the pole. You're going to be under everyone again, and then you're going to be fighting. Um, but at the same time, if someone is incredibly skilled, you, you can't deny that you gotta you gotta basically put them where they belong like when brandon for instance when he came in um he's a college wrestler you know three time uh a, a champion in college i'm like holy mackerel the guy's tough so yeah i promoted him to blue belt very quickly because he didn't belong at white belt um i made him learn a few things remote r related to bottom work the guard and then it was like on to blue belt you go and he never competed in any white belt tournaments i was like this is not allowed you competed expert no gi and you will do blue belt gi right because you have no business at white belt um and then because he'd be it would be dangerous some guy's mm. been training for three months and now he's going against like a three-time college uh, like, no this isn't happening um i also had a mma fighter who came and trained with us named tom um a good friend good um mentor of uh, brandon's and tom came in and he was an mma fighter um and he had trained for years and he just never got belted so he comes in on his first day wearing a white belt and he had on this camo gi and he's got wrestling shoes on so he looks out of place he looks like some goofball like <laughs> stepping off the street he comes in and he's just beating the brakes off of it like several people and someone comes up to me and they're like man who is this white belt shoey like jesus christ he choked me out like six times and i didn't i forgot i was like oh, oh, oh stop the class hey guys just letting you know tom's been training for like 12 13 14 years <laughs> you know and then so with tom he was on like the billy madison plan have you guys ever seen the movie billy madison yeah with, yeah uh, but uh, basically it's like where he goes to school and then he's like a, he was a dropout so they got to get him through you know a certain amount yeah. of classes uh and grade levels in order to uh Adam Sanderson. Sanderson. Oh, yeah. yeah but basically for, for anybody that like that's never seen the movie because maybe some young people listening and so he has to get through high school to get the inheritance well with uh tom basically we went from white to brown in like a year maybe year and a half but this but at the same time he had 12 15 years whatever it was experience on the back end like what am i supposed to do you're going to sit at this belt for two years each time like this is ridiculous like i got i would have a blue belt smashing some of the black belts and brown belts when he doesn't belong there so it's like on the brown belt you go because that's where you belong but assuming you get someone that is going through it you want the, i i think it's a smart idea that where if you find them running into resistance then great. Hey, here's where we're going to keep you for a little bit. So that this way you can get some confidence built in yourself before you make that next step. And so I still feel that way. But again, you always still have to allow, but everybody's different. And I think that's the thing about jujitsu. Uh, I think that a lot of times when we're dealing with these, we have these three, five belts, white, blue, purple, brown, black, and each one of them represents a sizable shift in skill and technique. 
and each person's a little different. Nobody's on this linear path. And I'm not a big fan of like just memorizing and regurgitating moves to get a belt promotion. Uh, I think it has to come from who are you on the mat and how is your skill progressing in relation to you as a person, your age, um, you know, your own unique situation, all that stuff. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I guess obviously brand is a competitor, so I completely get the, the, the fact he shouldn't be competing against white belts. Yeah. Um, I, I agree. It's, it's dangerous. The same, the same reason that judoka's black belts compete at blue belt straight off the bat. Yeah. Um, so I completely get that. Obviously, although he's able to uh, like sort of dominate, um, on the mats as a result of his, his, his wrestling background and his attributes. There's an argument there perhaps that he doesn't have a broad understanding of jujitsu as, as an art. So was it more about the fact that he was competing that you made that decision? If he wasn't competing um, and he was just in the practice room, do you feel you would have felt the same way? No, I think I would promote it to, to blue belt pretty quickly. Um, yeah. Because again, like again, we, we can talk about jujitsu. Like what is jujitsu, right? Like, j to me, jujitsu is, is interesting because it, it, yes, there are certain positions like the guard, the bottom position, which is a quintessential jujitsu technique. Brandon had a pretty damn good guard as a white belt because he was already into it. So he like, he, he doesn't showcase it on those videos all the time, but like, like the dude had great sweeps as a, um, as a white belt, he was sweeping people, getting on top. Um, and putting pressure on people. And even in some of his or like his blue belt tournaments, he's pulling guard on people playing around a little bit. But what is jujitsu? It's like, is, is it supposed to be based on like, you have to memorize these techniques and you have to do exactly these techniques for me to award this belt to you? Or it's like, you have the ability to put someone down and basically outposition them and submit them. And you have the ability to where if you were in a fight situation, you would be able to pummel the person or control yourself and protect yourself. Um, or you would be able to control yourself, whether you're on your back or you're on top. Brandon had those abilities very early as a white belt because of his his deep wrestling background and his in his basically thirst for more information. And so mm -hmm. I had no problem to me. He, he like, here's an example. I did have another college wrestler years ago who was, again, a D1 wrestler, very tough. Um, and he came in and he was like, I mean, he was incredibly tough on the feet. He'd taken down everybody. Um, he, he's a funny story because I asked him, it's like, uh, he came into the gym and he was like working out. I said, Hey man, would you like to come do some jujitsu? He's like, Oh, that sounds kind of fun. I'm like, have you ever done anything before? He said, well, I wrestled a little bit. He comes in for one of our takedown classes. I mean, he's just whoa, launching people. I said, Hey Tim, come here real quick. I said, well, you said you wrestled a little bit. He said, yeah, I was like, what's what's a little bit? And he was like, uh, he made it, to, he was a, a D1 All-American. Like, <laughs> I'm, I'm fuck like a little bit. Like you've been doing this since you were four, you asshole. So again, you know, so it's funny. So anyway, he gets in there, but he had, he didn't want to be on the guard. He wanted nothing to do with the bottom position. Um, he actually got a lot better as he got older, but there was a period where he wanted nothing to do with the guard. And I remember I was like, hey, you got to play off your back. He's like, why? I'll lose. I'm like, no, no, we're learning how to play this position in case you go there. He's, you know, so he didn't want to do it. I never gave him a blue belt. But Brandon was playing the game, right? So again, yeah, if I sure. have someone that's completely resistant to it, then yeah, I'm not mm -hmm. going to let them play. But Brandon was very open to it and playing and just was like soaking it all in from the moment he started training. So again, I promoted him to blue belt very quickly and then to purple belt very quickly because he won blue belt world championships. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't just because he was a great wrestler. It was also because he was really going after learning jujitsu technique. Because like I said, if it's not like tournament time, he's playing a lot of positions that – you know, you you wouldn't expect from a really tough wrestler to play. Yeah, no, I, th I think from what I've seen of, of Brandon, he, he looks really well rounded, mate. He looks great. So I was just using him as an example. Mm -hmm. But yeah, and, and then with black belt, I think I guess kind of the same question. So if you've got a black belt who is again just an absolute specimen, very strong competitor, but you know maybe couldn't show you you know a, a broadness of techniques. They've got a very good A game. You know they run through a division. You know, do you do you, do you think that person needs to have a broader knowledge of of all of the things to be a black belt, or again, is it the same sort of thing that applies? I guess it depends on what you think black belt means, right? So, mm -hmm. um, it depends because again, black belt can be different things. If you have a young guy who is, I mean, he's killing it at competitions, but doesn't maybe have the most well rounded knowledge. I think it's a decent idea to promote him to black as long. And so I'll, I'll talk more about my ideas on black belt, but I think, you know, if you're, if it's a competitive thing, it's a decent idea to promote him to black belt, because again, otherwise 
white to brown's all amateur. It's all like it's all minor league stuff, right? So like, because if you're a black belt, nobody gives a shit if you won the blue belt world championships, right? It's like you're a black belt now. The only thing you get to put on your record is your black belt stuff. You're like, I won purple belt, purple belt, brown, whatever. No, no. What, what do you want a black belt, bro? That's all people care about if you're a competitor. Mm-hmm. So I yeah. think there's a, it's a smart idea that once guys are doing well, if you're, if they're thinking competition, get them to black belt as soon as they can because their body's on limited time, right? Again, everybody has a limited span with this stuff. And if we spend our time grinding and breaking our body down at like the first five ranks, well, when you get to black belt, then what are you doing? Because this is this is where you're going to spend the most time in your jujitsu anyway. Um, you know, it, it's interesting the difference. Jujitsu has a big emphasis on the belts, whereas like say in judo, there's not. Um, in judo, it's like you can get a black belt in a few years. It literally just means that you're competent, and then it opens up. Black belt's a little different in jujitsu, where we think of it as something a little bit bigger, and that could be wrong or right. But I think if you got a guy that you're thinking is going to be a really good competitor. Don't worry about him because we want to get him to black belt where he can win the big tournaments at black belt and get it in the best years of his life opposed to, well, we spent four years at brown belt and he got his neck really wrenched up at some of those tournaments. Now he's a black belt, but his body's really chewed up. And so he's never going to be as good as he could have been when he could have had a good five, six year run at black belt, whatever, you know, because it's like I've seen guys where they win multiple tournaments, like big, big tournaments at these belts. I'm like, why are you still purple belt? Dude, we got to get, you should be moved up. Like you're wasting your time here. Your body's, your body's clock is ticking. You know, um, that said, I think that like for the average person for black belt, you, you think you do need to have a fairly well-rounded bit of knowledge because I think when you come into the gym as a black belt, whether you know it or not, you will be looked at as an example. People will come to you. They'll say, Hey, I need help. Can you show me something? Um, also I think that and I believe that you should be, you know, a relatively decent person. All of us are like, even the best of us, right? The best people, we're all goodish, right? We're good most of the time, but we can be some real shitheads sometimes. All of us can be, right? Myself included. Um, so I'm a nice guy, but at the same time, I'm not a nice guy all the time. And I can be a real asshole. So again, we want to make sure that we're at least they're decent people because when someone comes to the best of our knowledge, of course, because there will be times where people are going to come into, they're like, you're the example. You're a black belt. I'm going to look at you as the example of how I should treat people on the mat, how I should be on the mat, um, the way I should do things, technical or behavioral. And so I think that those people should lead by example, where it should be both their ability to do technical abilities, um, have a good understanding of teaching, and they can teach jujitsu, um, but also too they should be a good representation. If you're the black belt, like at my gym, of like what sort of what sort of behavior, what kind of atmosphere and culture do I want to have in the gym? And these guys are going to be bearing that torch along the way. And so it should feel like, you know, if, if I'm not here, it should feel very similar to me opposed to, you know, well, Chewy's really nice guys, but I mean, his black belts are assholes, you know, that kind of thing. You don't want to have that. Um, mm-hmm. So those are a couple of different ideas. I, again, I think there is a, a delineation between a pure competitor black belt where you're young and you're just like you you're trying to win competitions versus someone who is kind of more of a well-rounded maybe you were a competitor maybe you're a competitor too but also you're like you're your average black belt you want them to be a little bit more well-rounded well-rounded and be effective uh, but also be able to you know bear the torch and again even that said if i had a competitor that was amazing but they were a real like turd burger you know like people <laughs> then i'm not going to promote them i'm like bro you're you're I've, and i've had that before i had really talented people like really talented young men who came in who did not carry the the ethos of the gym. They did not carry the um, the way that we should treat people on the mat. So I never promoted them past certain belts and they left. And I'm like, that's fine because I'm not going to promote you um, because you're not being the way you're not. And it's okay. You can go somewhere else. But in this gym, we're going to treat people with a certain level of respect and dignity. And we're going to be this way too. And we're not going to treat people in yeah. that way. And, and did you did you sort of communicate that? Did you have that conversation with those individuals when you did that? Oh, of course. Yeah, of course. I mean, you got to you got to talk to people, you know, and you do it in the best you can. You know, say, hey, like th- this is the way that we do things here, you know, and um, you do that both through the unwritten sort of this is how it is. Um, but then you call them out on their bullshit. And if they don't, then I mean, it is what it is. Like, again, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. It's this is the culture. And again, you got to think the gym culture is important because it's like um it's cancerous, right? So if you get a per- if you get a bad person in the midst of your gym, it can create a weird culture in the gym, weird vibes. You can sometimes have people where they get they step on the mat, and then the, it's like all of a sudden the the vibe gets heavy. It goes from being this fun, like lighthearted atmosphere, and all of a sudden it's like, ooh, I feel weird now. It's, it wasn't like it just was a minute ago. And you got to snip those people out because it's like having a plant grow. Or sometimes you got to trim little stems so that the 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 plant can continue to grow and flower. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's fair. And uh, just just try to circle back a little bit, just just back to sort of white belt and, and maybe as well, all belts, I guess, to some extent, but white belt in particular, we talked a little bit about competition there. Um, yeah. and obviously there's a, there's a difference. You've got your competitors, you've got your hobbyists. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you think it's important for hobbyists to compete? Mm. I don't think that it's necessarily important. I think it's useful. I think you learn a lot about yourself through competition because it's highly stressful. Um, it'll expose a lot of areas of your game, uh, some of the weaknesses and uh, some of your strengths. You'll find out really what your game is made of. And I think those there's a lot of usefulness. Like a lot of times we would say that a training or doing a competition is like three months or six months worth of training because you get so much into it, both from the standpoint of preparing for it, but also all the value of experience that you'll get from it. And I think it can be very useful for people. I would tell anybody that they need to do it. Like if you're like 50 years old and you're just like, I just want to do this. You don't need to compete if you don't want to. You can if you want, right? They have master's divisions, um, but it's there. The one thing that I would say is that if you want to compete, but you're afraid, then you should definitely compete, right? Because there's a lot of people that I think fool themselves. They're like, oh, I don't really want to compete. But it's like they would compete if they could win. If they knew they could win, they'd go compete. Well, it's like, well, then you want to compete. You're just afraid. <laughs> because if like, if I said to you, you're guaranteed to win, do you want to go compete? If they're like, no, nah, I don't really want to. I'm just not interested. You don't want to compete then. But if I said, you're guaranteed to win, do you want to compete? They're like, yeah. Well, then you want to compete. You're just scared because you're like, well, what if I lose? What if this happens? Whatever. You're the what ifs, right? Mm -hmm. And so to me, it's like if you want to compete, but you're a little afraid, you should go compete because, again, that's that's how you become a stronger person. That's It doesn't matter. It doesn't even matter if you win. It just matters that you did something that was difficult, that made you uncomfortable, that made you nervous, and you came out on the other side stronger for it. Yeah, cool. Good advice. Thank you. Um, last question, mate, and I think we'll, we'll let you crack on. We've had you a while, so appreciate it. No worries, brother. Just looking at obviously the evolution of jujitsu and you know the the growth of of sort of nogi competition. Just thinking forward, like five years from now, what do you think the landscape's going to look like for jujitsu? Do you think that like the gi's dying, or do you think it's uh, you know how do you think it's going to maybe change? Mm, gi dying? Um, who knows? I I, I think that jujitsu goes through these cyclical cycles, and I've seen this since I started. Right the technical development changes right but you see these things come back around where it's like oh half guard's the new thing right like so like half guard comes out of brazil in like it was the late 90s or something and like at least to america and it's like whoa half guard you know i remember we we, we started getting half guard here in like the early 2000s it was just like whoa half guard this is crazy we don't have to lock our guard around people um and then it was a different position. It's like, oh, now we got this position, this position. Then it was like, okay, um, deep half. And then it was bare and bolo, you know, and then all this stuff, 50-50. <laughs> and then it's like, hey, full guard's really awesome. Oh, full guard. Hell yeah, full guard. Like, you know, you see Jacob Couch. <laughs> Jacob Couch using full guard. I watched him go to the uh, – Jacob Couch won the ADCC trials and, like, submitted several guys with full guard. I'm like, mind blown we're back to full guard now right so <laughs> it, it just cycles through and so you see these things happen so i think um i don't i the, the technical evolution these things get deeper and deeper um but i think that like the actual positions they're just going to stay they're just doing this i mean you can only contort your body in so many directions uh so again it just basically comes up with hey this is how i'm doing this and a lot of times it's like the same stuff like you can i remember when like baron bolo came out it's like my coach was showing me an old vhs tape from like the 90s of like some guy doing it in like the the mundials back in the 90s so it's like but we were like this is brand new no this isn't brand new this they were doing it back then <laughs> they just went a little deeper with it so i think that's what yeah. you'll see there as far as the gi going though man it's like i don't know the thing that i will say about the gi is i as i've gotten older i like the gi less um because most people say they like it because they can hang on to stuff right but dude the gi the, the fabric it catches my joints and everything else it hurts my hands someone pulls on my neck constantly by my collar you know all that stuff's very uncomfortable whereas if it's no gi i just peel the grip off I can just hand fight with you. Um, you can't you can't pull with this artificial handle on my neck forever, right? Um, and there, and if my arm gets caught in something, there's no fabric to like cinch up on, so I can wiggle it out a little bit easier, opposed to getting it wrapped up or some guy wrapping his lapel around my knee, and now I have this weird force that's pulling my knee in a strange direction and and pushing on my tendon. Um, so I don't actually like it as much. There's plenty of ways to slow things down in nogi if you know how to do it. 
without using the gi, you can slow things down. It just changes a little bit. The handles change. Um, so as I get older, I like the gi less. I still train in the gi every week, um, but I like it a little less. I still think there's value to doing it. Um, and I still think in jujitsu, it's like you should figure out, by the way, anybody that's having this sort of like debate over what they like, you choose what you like. Don't listen to anyone else because everybody like it's I remember like 10 years ago, Eddie Bravo was talking about how bad the gi is. And I have students who are like, hey, bro, Eddie Bravo said this. I'm like, well, what do you think? You know, like, well, I don't know. You, you just started training. You don't even have an you don't even have an educated opinion. Stop listening to other people. Have your own experience, right? Um, and so do that because it, I've had students that literally said, "I am never wearing the gi." They put the damn gi on and they're like, "I love the gi. This is so fun." <laughs> Right. I'm like, just do your own thing, bro. Um, mm. And so I, I think that, you know, you'll see these like ebbs and flows and these cyclical things. And, you know, it'll, it, all it takes is w like a couple like really popular competitors to be like, we like the gi. And then people like, I like the gi too. And then all of a sudden the gi comes <laughs> back. Right. Um, so it is what it is, man. I, I, I think really what would make the gi a little bit better or a little bit more attractive is if, is if they like adjusted the rule set to where they got rid of like all the lapel stuff where you're like latch. It, it just slows the game down so much and it makes it incredibly boring to watch. Um, mm. Cause there's a lot of really amazing gi matches out there that are so much fun to watch. But yeah. again, when you start getting these guys where they're taking this lapel and wrapping around, it just slows the game down to such a crawl. Um, I think that like the gi would be made more interesting if they had like, like breaks or standups kind of like in judo where, you know, if there's nothing happening, break you just have to do them a little bit longer but like if you get into a 50 50 with the, the gi and there's no hill hooks you're just you're just screwing around now right let's mm -hmm. break stand back up let's reset or if you get a guy that's got like the lapel guards wrapped around the guy's knee and they're just stuck uh it's been 30 seconds here break let's stand back up let's reset you know i think the gi would be, be better like that where they had those breaks to actually make it more interesting um because you have this artificial material that you can use because even like in judo a lot of that stuff would be illegal because you're not allowed to manipulate the gi in certain ways uh because of stalling issues and i mm -hmm. think that they there's some things i don't like about judo but i think they have that right about the gi because certain handles and lapel grips and everything else can really slow the action down and make it very unattractive to watch um in and i mean watch not just from a pure spectator but even from like a jiu-jitsu spectator where even we don't like watching it and you know like we like the stuff um, so just an idea there. Yeah, no, it's a couple of interesting points there. I, um, typically would say to people as I've got older, I prefer the gi because I like slowing the game down. But mm -hmm. now you've said that actually my hands hurt every time I train the gi and they, <laughs> they, don't, they don't with an no gi. So, so actually I'll probably need to rethink that stance. Perhaps it's probably a good shout. I mean, it, 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 the thing is, is like, if, and this is where like, I eventually want to put some stuff together. Cause like, you know, I have like, I have like courses and video series and stuff like that on my website that I sell. So I eventually want to come up with something cause I'm going through it now and I'm writing it all down. Cause like most people, all right. Like when you get a course, you go get an instructional, who do you get? You'll go get a guy who's like 21 years old, who's in his physical prime and you're trying to mimic him. Like, mm -hmm. but you're 45, like you're not doing that. Like you're not going to be able to do that stuff probably. So trying to come up with something that's a little bit more uh, useful for like us older guys as we're getting older to be like, look, and, and basically coming from the standpoint, I used to be able to do this stuff. I can do it now, but it's not, it wears me out. Here's what I'm doing now. And then share that. That's something I'm working on. Cause I think that'll be super helpful for a lot of the older guys in training, mm. because like, as I'm changing my game in Nogi and learning how to slow the game down dramatically, it's like, I wish I knew these grips like five, 10 years ago, because even from a, even when I was younger, it would have been helpful, but especially as I'm getting older, it's very helpful to understand this stuff. Old man jits. That's what <laughs> we need. <laughs> Drink our Metamucil and then, uh, or fiber pills or whatever, and then get out there and let's do some jujitsu. Yeah, mate. You guys laugh, man. I went to the, I went to master worlds one time. There was a guy, he came out there and he had a, he had a little walker, like he, or a little cane, like he had a little cane. He's going out to the match <laughs> and he's like stumbling around. He gets up to the mat. He has an inhaler. He <laughs> hits the inhaler and then he puts it down, starts smacking his face and he jumps out on the mat. And it's like, it's like his body just remembered how to be 25 for like five <laughs> minutes and he goes real hard and him and this guy are just beating the crap out of each other and he gets his hand raised he's like yeah jesus who, who, who. you know making all these things he gets done with the match and it's like as soon as his foot steps off the tatami <laughs> his back goes back down he picks up his walker <laughs> and he like hobbles his old ass back up to the podium to collect his gold medal i was like man look at that that's something i'm like i'm that's gonna be me someday
Yeah, maybe that or it could have been some really high level mind games there, mate. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, imagine that. Playing He's just possum. putting it on. <laughs> yeah. I, I, no, dude, I, th- I think it's like our bodies remember this. It's like you, um, have you ever watched some of those videos, those old boxers, where they're just like, you know, they look old and decrepit, but then it's all of a sudden a shh, shh. Like, you know, even like Muhammad Ali, right? Like, I remember seeing him as a kid because we were in, we're in Louisville, right? And he would, he's like this, you know, he, he's from Louisville originally. So he was this famous figure and he would do functions and stuff. Even after he had, you know, really bad uh, Parkinson's and his hand would be shaking. But the, then he would throw a punch. And it was still kind of quick, you know, <laughs> mm-hmm. considering all the other ailments. It's like he could throw a quick punch. You're like, whoa, you know, so I think sometimes we have these muscle patterns ingrained in us and they get so deep in there that like, you know, I've done jujitsu literally in my sleep where I'm laying with my wife and I'm like, like wrist fighting. And she's like, you know, twi- I'm twitching and like rolling wrists. And she's like, I got to get out of here because he's about to choke me to sleep. <laughs> so I think that stuff gets ingrained in us where, you know, even if our body gets older, then we go out there and it's like we remember how to do this thing that we've done for such a long time. And then it just turns back on for a, for a moment. Yeah, Steve, Steve Hollister is a great example of that. And he's a lifetime karate guy, brown belt jiu-jitsu, but he, he had a really bad hip and he'd walk around with like a limp for like the whole time I've known him. And he had a hip replacement. The okay. fucker was back on the mats within like six weeks. <laughs> yeah, and now he's like dude. fully recovered and he's like an absolute fucking assassin again. And you think uh-huh. this this guy, you know, you see him walking around with his bad hip, he needs a hip replacement, but he still was on the mats murdering people. Mm-hmm. And I'd be like, you can't walk fucking 10 yards without limping, but you can get on the mat and fucking rag me around. <laughs> like, it yeah, bro. cracks me up. It's cool. A fucking glimpse into the future, isn't it? For sure. <laughs> yes, it is. We'll be there soon. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Chewy, if people want to, uh, if want to, people want to find your instructionals, that sort of thing, where can they, uh, where can they find it, mate? So obviously you guys can search uh, on the internet. You can put in Chujitsu, C-H-E-W-J-I-T-S-U on YouTube or whatever. That's where most people find me. Um, if you've watched that stuff or whatever, you like it. Um, I do have an email that I send out every day. Um, and you can get that by going to, um, if you go to probably the easiest way, the easiest URL that I have is chujitsu.net slash j-o-i-n join j-o-i-n um and you'll join my email group i call the chew crew and when you join i'll give you um i'll give you a couple ebooks but you'll get my daily email and the daily email could be everything from you know philosophical ideas sometimes i'm talking about training tips stuff like that books i'm reading um and then every now and then like this this past week i was sharing some troll messages that i get um (laughs) there was a there was someone that was sending me some really weird messages asking for like a really weird pictures and so i was like like i I just or something (laughs) No, no, no. So it was basically like they wanted they wanted pictures of like my my gi open where like my my pectoral <laughs> muscles were kind of showing. Um, and it's like they were sending me a message like, man, um, in, in the, the Instagram profile has a picture of a woman, but I'm like almost 100 percent certain it's probably a dude. And it's uh, they were asking about they wanted to see my my sexy man nipples slip out, be, you know, and just so that was it. So it was like it, uh, in a, every three to six months, I'll get a message like, hey, can I get one of those pictures or whatever? They're just, every, they just keep it up. So I, uh, I was having fun. We had a good laugh at that. And uh, so you never know what you're going to get in there, but I keep it fun and entertaining. And then if you are interested in any instructionals and stuff, I share them through that. Um, but don't worry. It's, I don't really hard sell anything. Most of it's like I'm having fun with the email and I'll be like, hey, by the way. I got this open if you want it. So, uh, but that's where you can find me at jujitsu.net is my website. You can get there and you can find all the e- uh, information or you can find me on YouTube at jujitsu. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll pop that in our description, mate. We'll pop your OnlyFans account in there as well so people can check, check out your notes. <laughs> <laughs> but mate, it's been an absolute pleasure, mate. Really appreciate your time. It's been awesome to meet you and have a chat. Thank you. Appreciate you, fellas. Cheers, mate. Cheers, mate.